well-known family professor in the psychology department at Harvard University. His books include The Language Instinct, How the Mind Works, and The Blank Slate, The Modern Denial of Human Nature. Professor Pinker's latest book is The Stuff of Thought, Language as a Window into Human Nature. And now, In Depth, with Steven Pinker. Steven Pinker, what's a rabbit hole? <laughs> uh, I got that from Alice in Wonderland. Of course. It is an entry to a uh, world of wonders that you stumble upon when looking for something else. And then this was the cover of your first or second book? That was my second book, yeah. <laughs> and what were you, at what point in time did you decide to really make a career out of the issue of cognitive science? Uh, I, I think uh, maybe my first or second year of college, mm -hmm. uh, although I was uh, always interested in, in the human mind. But when I learned that there was a field called cognitive psychology, later called cognitive science, uh, and, and found out that they actually pay, pay people for doing it, for figuring out how the mind works, uh, I knew that that's what I wanted to do with my life. So explain that to someone who's never really thought much about cognitive science. Yes, well, when most people think of psychology, they think of psychotherapy, sure. right? the guy with the couch mm -hmm. and then the, the, the notebook and trying to uh, cure people's neuroses. Uh, but most psychology is a research field, experimental psychology, tries to figure out what makes, pe makes people tick by uh, doing uh, laboratory studies. Cognitive psychology focuses on uh, intelligence, on memory, thinking, language, reasoning, imagery, and cognitive science is just the, more, the interdisciplinary study of uh, how we think, including other fields like linguistics, philosophy, neuroscience, anthropology. And I suppose there's a lot of difference of opinion. There areas. is a lot of difference of opinion. So let's get your opinions on, this, on, the, on, on the table first. What do you see as the main issue of the study of the brain and its relationship with how we live? Uh, the main issue. Um, well, I think you have to uh, first have some understanding of what the mind is for, what it evolved to do. Because unlike other intelligent devices like computers, which were put together by engineers for specific purposes, uh, the brain evolved. And uh, the, I think the first question one has to ask is, why, why are we smart? Why do we have brains? Uh, I don't think there's a single answer, because there are a lot of things that uh, an intelligent organism has to do to, to stay alive. Uh, understand the physical world. Uh, process visual input to know what are the objects out there and how they're arranged. But also uh, getting beneath the surfaces of objects to figure out their causal relations. Uh, what can I throw? What can I bend? What can I use as a poison? Uh, what can I use as a projectile? Uh, then we also live in a social w world. Uh, the brain also evolved to uh, make alliances, to learn from other people, to exchange favors, to find mates, to bring up children. Uh, and in the human case, that involves language, the most efficient way of exchanging ideas and uh, negotiating social relationships. So why do I do it differently than you do it? Well, uh, I'm uh, more impressed by what we all have in common as a species than in what makes people different. I think we do have an inkling as to what makes people different. One factor is, is surely genetics. That is, we aren't clones other than identical twins, and we each start out life with a slightly different complement of genes, which biases the brain in, in uh, different ways. Uh, and we know this from studies of people who do or don't share genes or an environment. Identical twins reared apart, for example, who share their genes but not their environment and who turn out to be strikingly similar, uh, tell us that, that genes matter. So do adopted siblings brought up in the same household who don't share their variable genes but do share an environment and they grow up not particularly alike other than what they share from the culture. So one thing that makes us different is our genes. Uh, another thing is uh, the different cultures that we may have grown up in. We're similar not just because we're human beings, but because we both grew up in North America and, and uh, were surrounded by American middle class values. Um, there's also sheer chance, even if we were identical twins, we would not end up indistinguishable. And any, anyone who knows identical twins knows that this is true. They're very similar in their talents and in their temperaments, but you don't confuse them if you know them and they'll often go their separate ways. Sometimes one will even be gay and another one will be straight, even though they share both their genes and their environment. 
So what that tells us is that sheer chance makes a difference. That some factor that we have no idea of how to measure, maybe how your neurons uh, grew as your brain congealed in utero, maybe chance events that took place that uh, to, to one twin but not another twin, uh, there's a huge role of chance that we don't really understand, and it's kind of a, uh, an, another factor that uh, makes us what we are, makes us different, and, but people don't really understand how it works. Is it too, too simple to say it's a nature versus nurture argument? Yeah, I think it is, because uh, it's not nature versus nurture. If we didn't have a nature that allowed us to see the world in certain ways and learn in certain ways, then nurture would have no effect. I mean, uh, you put a child in a family and you put a cat in a, fa in a family, the child ends up talking, the cat doesn't. Now, the child had to learn to talk. The child, no child is born speaking English, but the uh, exposure to English only resulted in an ability to speak because the child's brain is wired in certain ways that the cat's brain isn't. So it's never nature versus nurture. It's nature makes the effects of nurture possible. I want to go through some of your, your books and just to give us a, an idea of how your thought process evolved. If you tell us a little bit about what, uh, about them. This is the language instinct, how the mind creates language, and it was uh, 1994, 15 years ago almost. Yes, right. What were you trying to do here? Uh, share the excitement of uh, the science of language. Uh, I, uh, I felt that the time was ready to tell a unified story about how language works, namely that it's, I, I argue that it's a, a human adaptation, a part of the human species birthright. Uh, and uh, enough was known about language, in particular about exactly the kind of questions that curious people have, like who decides what's proper, proper grammar, uh, why are there so many languages, uh, how do kids learn to talk? Where do new words come from? Uh, but I felt that I could share this accumulated research from my field and hope that, that people would be interested. Did you believe that people would be as interested in it as they were? It became a national bestseller. No, no, not at all. Did, my, you, my, you were surprised. I was surprised. Yeah. Yeah. My friend said, "You know, you, you write a book, a popular book. It's on the, uh, uh, on the on the shelves of the bookstore for six weeks, and then it vanishes into oblivion." And and I wrote it prepared for that to happen. And so do you think you just tapped something that others hadn't, or you told the story differently? Um, I think I did tap something that, that uh, others hadn't, namely the, the genre of popular science writing, which had been pioneered by, by writers like Stephen Jay Gould and Richard Dawkins and Lewis Thomas and, and others, uh, had never been applied to the sciences of mind. And people are interested in the mind at least as much as they're interested in dinosaurs and genes and galaxies and so on. Uh, so I think I was, uh, uh, by applying the art of popular science writing to the human mind, I think I found a niche. So three years later, how the mind works. What were you doing here? Uh, <laughs> what, what was I thinking? What were Writing you a thinking? book called How the Mind Works. <laughs> I tried to do for the rest of the mind what I had tried to do previously for language, namely, share the, uh, the science in an accessible way, but also uh, if you're just uh, all over the place and, and, uh, and you don't have a coherent framework or narrative, I don't think it's possible to succeed in writing a book that people will be interested in. There has to be some overall uh, framework into which you fit the hundreds or thousands of studies. And, and as with the language instinct, for how the mind works was based on a couple of ideas. One of them was the one that we mentioned at the outset, namely evolution. You can't understand any complex system without knowing what it was designed to do. The equivalent in the case of a natural system, like the brain, is what did evolution select it for. But also the idea of thinking as information processing or computation that uh, the uh, that intelligence doesn't come from some magic power or special juice or, or even from uh, the fact that we have brains because uh, other species have brains but they don't do what we do and that the difference comes I think from the way the neural tissue is organized to process information and so some of the concepts that uh, we use to make sense of man-made intelligence systems codes, representations, signals, transformations. The whole lingo of communication and information theory can be applied to the human mind to shed light on things like memory, language, and vision. And that was the other idea that I put into how the mind works. And then in 1999, this word 
This uh, work, uh, words and rules, the ingredients of language. Oh boy, rules. <laughs> yes, I know that. Now, that was a tall order. That, that actually was on my own research. The other books were an overview of my field. This one concentrated on my own research. And believe it or not, it was an attempt to write a popular book on irregular and regular verbs. Now, it doesn't sound like a recipe for a bestseller. Uh, and, and I say it, I, it falls in the great academic tradition of knowing more and more about less and less until, until you know everything about nothing. But I, I had the, the uh, idea to write the book because I thought that this was uh, actually could serve as a different uh, entry point, a different rabbit hole, if you want, into the workings of language. The idea was that irregular verbs are things like come, came, break, broke, mm -hmm. stink, stank, uh, which are unpredictable and have to be memorized. You only become aware of them when you learn some other language, and the first thing you have to do is you memorize all the con irregular conjugations. Whereas a regular verb is something like walk, walked, play, played, where the past tense is predictable. Just add the ed suffix. And uh, though it sounds kind of dry, uh, these, are, I argued, are examples of the two processes that make language possible, namely memory, which is what we have to do when we learn words. We, uh, a, a literate adult knows maybe 100,000 words, each of which had to have been memorized. But of course, we don't just blurt out words or cliches or formulas, but we assemble them in real time into sentences using rules. Uh, computational algorithms. And so the, these two ingredients of language, memory for words, uh, computation for phrases and sentences, I argued are on display in microcosm in the irregular verbs which we memorize and the regular verbs which we compose. We you were quoted someplace as saying that the most hate mail you've ever gotten is about irregular verbs. <laughs> well, is that correct? Well, I, I, would, I wouldn't say the hate mail, but certainly the biggest academic controversies. Yeah, it gets ugly. <laughs> The ivory tower. And then uh, the blank slate, 2002. That was on the concept of human nature. And I was pushed to write that in part because of the, some of the reactions that I got to how the mind works, where uh, there were objections, both from the left and from the right, that were as political and moral as they were scientific. Uh, that the idea of an inborn human nature rooted in the biology of the brain in turn rooted in genetics and evolution, is an idea that strikes people as uh, uncomfortable, even dangerous. And uh, so I wanted to, so much of, the, uh, of the, the criticism from how the mind works was on these foundational, almost philosophical issues that I thought they had to be addressed. And for the, the, the political left, there are fears of uh, innate biological differences. If mm -hmm. men and women aren't identical biologically, Will that set the cause of women's progress back? Um, uh, racial differences, individual differences, are, do some people succeed more than others in society, not because of uh, prejudice, but because they're smarter or harder working than others? That um, seems like a challenge to egalitarian uh, ideals. Perfectibility, can we design a utopian society when we raise children without selfishness and violence, or will selfishness and violence always be part of human nature and therefore have to be dealt with by some kind of punitive method? Um, those are concerns from the left. From the right, there are concerns if we're really products of evolution. Uh, does that just mean that we um, selfishly try to propagate our genes and are deaf to higher moral callings? Does it mean that the foundations of religion, such as scriptures, uh, have to be thrown out, including all the moral stuff, like the Ten Commandments, if the story of how we came to be turns out to be uh, incorrect? Will there be uh, infinite uh, Twinkie defenses, <laughs> excuses for bad behavior? My genes made me do it. My evolutionary history made me do it. So we can never hold people morally responsible. So there's this whole can of, of worms that's opened when you study human mind from a biological framework. And the blank slate was about, uh, about those worms. And who uh, in, is the opposition? In opposition is maybe not the right word. Who would, would most likely be the people who would disagree with you most right now? I'm talking about the scientists who are working in this field. And so not these political and moral? Not the political. Well, oh. it, in the whole thing. Yeah. Well, in the, the political and moral sphere, there's the, there's the, the politically correct left mm -hmm. that uh, 
uh, doesn't want to admit the possibility of any human differences. There's also the, I guess I can call it the politically correct right, because it's a different kind of political correctness, but the, the uh, pro-religion, um, family values, traditional uh, mores, uh, sometimes seem to be in opposition to a, an evolutionary or biological framework. Within academia, there are uh, people who uh, want to attribute more to the environment than, than I do. People who work in uh, neural network modeling, who try to devise models that uh, soak up uh, correlations of information in the environment and, and try to get away with less um, pre-programming. There are people who believe in uh, that the mind has less structure than I would be willing to attribute. That is, that it's less organized into si subsystems or modules or mental organs, and rather that we have one all-purpose learning device that we use for everything. Um, so that's some of the opposition. Last year, this book, The Stuff of Thought, we get really into the language part. Yes. What were you so, trying to do? Uh, this tried to combine my interest in language with my interest in human nature. What can we learn about human nature through language? And not through language, as in the language instinct of how language itself works. What, is the, what are the gears and belts and pulleys that allow us to put words together? But this one looks at meaning. What do words mean? What do sentences mean? Uh, how do we use words in social interaction? What can we learn about, say, uh, the human concept of space and time from words like prepositions and uh, past, present, future tense? which are about space and time. What can we learn about um, uh, causality, the human concept of causality from the way we use verbs? And even in later chapters, I, I switch from cognition to emotion and social relationships. What can we learn about human emotion from swearing? Uh, and, and why are some words swear words? And why do we swear in such bizarre ways? And innuendo, why don't we say what we mean? Why do we constantly veil our intentions in, in euphemism and doublespeak and innuendo and taboo. Why do I say, uh, would you like to come up and see my etchings instead of do you want to have sex? Why do I say, um, if you could pass the salt, that would be awesome, instead of give me the salt? Uh, and I use that euphemism and innuendo as a way of probing our social interactions. Well, this is a political network, so let's <laughs> dive into that whole issue of, of how politicians and lawmakers use language to their benefit. You looked at this in this book yeah, oh, and yes, in some of right. your other works, too. What did, what did you find? Well, uh, there a number of phenomena go on in the crafting of language to political purposes. Uh, one of them is innuendo and euphemism. That is, if anything you say as a politician uh, has some danger of alienating some constituency, um, how do you say something that will alienate the fewest as, uh, as possible? And you're forced often to um, vaguer and vaguer, windier and loftier uh, and emptier speech. Uh, the most you could hope for is what's sometimes called dog whistle rhetoric, namely messages that are pitched at such a high level uh, that only certain constituencies can hear them. They know you're talking to them, uh, but other people don't know what you're talking about. And so you can get them into your camp without alienating the people who don't know that you're using code words for one thing or another. So you have empty things like uh, change. Uh, you know, who could be against change? Uh, but of course, what the change is very much depends on uh, your, your orientation in the first place. Uh, when you have a politician uh, who, who deviates from that formula, being vague and empty, you have uh, the, what we know as the gaffe. Uh, and Michael Kinsley had the classic definition of a political gaffe. A gaffe in Washington is when a politician says something that's true. <laughs> <laughs> and it is uh, the reason we, we're all hypocrites in the sense that we complain about politicians' empty rhetoric, but on the other hand, as soon as they speak honestly, then that's what the journalists pounce on, uh, Joe Biden being the famous example. Uh, and because a lot of political journalism consists of waiting for the gaffe, that puts a pressure on politicians to avoid gaffes by avoiding saying anything. Uh, you have, I have a quote from you here. We're forcing politicians to give us more empty rhetoric. Yes. 
Uh, I think I think uh, what a lot of political coverage uh, ends up doing. And has that evolved, or has that always been there? I suspect it's always been there. It may have gotten. You have a sense that it's gotten worse in the last uh, 10, 15 years, but uh, but I suspect it's always been there. So when you listen to a politician, what do you listen to? What are you listening for? Well, I listen. I certainly listen for certain habits of of of. Uh, mind and, and decision making. Uh, I don't believe that anyone has an ideology that's going to steer them through every possible crisis and contingency. But I'm interested in the politician who can evaluate uh, different opinions that uh, takes steps not to impose a group think where one opinion just becomes the only thing that's considered in a group of like-minded people. Someone who will uh, assess uh, incoming evidence and uh, perhaps change course as the facts shift. Someone who will seek out expertise. Uh, someone who will basically uh, uh, apply intelligence to the very challenging problems that, that any president inevitably will face. And to what extent is the choice of words a part of that? Well, it is uh, partly so that we can assess what how a politician thinks and what a politician believes. But of course, the art of rhetoric is one of the main tools by which a politician in a democracy can assemble coalitions that can work together. Stirring rhetoric, uh, if it's not deceptive or, or divisive, can bring people along enough to get something done. And, and of course, successful presidents have often been successful communicators. Roosevelt, Kennedy, Reagan, uh, and so on, uh, above their uh, intelligence, they had the, the gift of getting people to cooperate. About 10 years ago right now, you had a piece in the New York Times and it had this in it. The law requires language to do something for which it is badly designed. Leave nothing to the imagination. Lawmakers and lawyers do their best to co-op language for this unnatural job, but even their prolix definitions and legalese inevitably leave room for alternative interpretations that a clever adversary will find. Yes, I think that, that was the one in response to uh, Clinton's testimony during That's the, right. uh, after the Paula Jones deposition, where he infamously said, uh, when asked uh, whether he, he was having a sexual relationship with Monica Lewinsky, said, um, well, it depends on what the meaning of is is. Uh, that is when he, he was challenged after his lawyer had said there is no sex of right. any kind. Um, and he said, it depends on what the meaning of is is. Uh, something that I return to in the stuff of thought, where I look at the semantics of tense. What is, what, what is the present tense? What is the past tense? And uh, use that to analyze Clinton's uh, self-defense. Uh, I, I gave him a, a good grade. Uh, I think he was an astute, uh, intuitive linguist. And what he said, uh, mainly, when asked the question, his affair was over. And when he was asked, is, is there any sex? And he said, no, in the present tense. The, uh, the occasion for that closing sentence, though, was the fact that, of course, what the prosecutor was interested in was not whether he was currently involved in an affair, but whether he ever had had one in, in recent history. Clinton was aware of that as well. And he said, my goal of the deposition was to be truthful, but not helpful. Now. The question is, uh, in, in a court of law, is that a defensible strategy? Prob well, I'll, I'll leave it to the lawyers to decide that. But what he was exploiting was the fact that in an ordinary conversation, we do both. You can't have an ordinary conversation unless you're both truthful and helpful. If you're not helpful, you're either lying or you're uh, going on at such length that your listener is going to get up and leave. Can you give an example? Well, we would talk, if you have to spell everything out, your speech would sound like a legal contract. Uh, because if I were to say, um, how, much, uh, you know, how, how much longer will this take? Well, what does this mean? Um, in context, you're thinking, well, it's probably the, our give and take until the, fo the calls come in. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's because you and I both have the same model as to what's happening. I don't have to spell out what this means. Uh, and when I say how much longer, you're not going to say um, 7 minutes 42.1 seconds because you know I don't need it to that degree of precision. There are, we're, we're not even aware of all of the missing steps that we unconsciously fill in and all of the intelligent guesses we make about the other person's expectations. But isn't that where miscommunication comes in? It often is, exactly. And 
in a court of law when instead of having conversational partners who cooperate to move the conversation along, you have adversaries, then each side can exploit what is left unsaid and then uh, in order to withhold the damaging truth from the other side and then you get a departure from the ordinary uh, rules of conversation in the courtroom. And that's why Clinton, though I think technically correct, uh, drew such fury. And in fact, his uh, his statement about it depends on what the meaning it is is was uh, cited as one of the five articles of impeachment when he was impeached. Well, the answer to your question is we're going to go to the phone calls now. Okay. <laughs> our guest this month on In Depth is Stephen Pinker, and we are going to open up our phones. We invite you to join us. He is going to be with us for two and a half more hours, a full three-hour program, a chance to talk about his complete body of work. Here's how you can join us if you like. Uh, if you live in the East or Central time zone, 202-737-0001, and if you live in the Mountain or Pacific time zone, 202-737-0002. We have an email address. Some people prefer to send their questions in that way. We will get on as many as we can. It's booktv at cspan.org. And we're going to start with an email question that came in even before the program started. This questioner asked, can I change my genetic makeup with willpower? In order, <laughs> in other words, focus attention and action until it becomes uh, automatized. Automatized, yeah. Ah, okay. Well, you can certainly automatize things. That is, when you say when you learn how to drive, mm -hmm. first you think through every motion of the stick shift, then it becomes automatic. And that involves a chain in, change in connection strengths in certain parts of the brain that allow you to do things without thinking about it. It doesn't literally change your genetic makeup in the sense of the sequence of, of uh, um, bases in the DNA molecule, uh, but it does change what becomes uh, uh, second nature. In fact, that we call it second nature because it's the acts as if it's in your human nature, but it's something that you acquire. So the same caller says, presuming that I don't like certain inherited, inherited thought processes that I have, uh, or behaviors or impulses, what mechanisms mm -hmm. in my brain allow me for this dissident thinking that I might change? Yes. Well, I think people can change, certain can change within a, uh, a certain range, and different, for different people the ranges are in different places. Mm -hmm. It gets, probably gets harder and harder as you approach the limits of your range. But of course, that's why we have education, that's why we make New Year's resolutions. That's why we try to change uh, social norms. Uh, and people do, of course, in inhibit uh, impulses. They, uh, they set alarm clocks. They turn off the TV. They say no to a second helping of dessert. Uh, they, they read. They practice. They take lessons. There are lots of ways in which we can um, uh, change our, our habits. Uh, some of them involve parts of the brain like the, uh, the basal ganglia, which are two nuclei, sets of nuclei buried deeply within the brain that package routines of behavior so that you can just kind of turn them on instead of thinking through each step. Uh, for motor sequences like a, a golf swing or a baseball pitch, the cerebellum, uh, that kind of little brain hanging at the back of your brain, uh, executes smooth motions uh, as a result of practice. The frontal lobes, the parts in the uh, right behind your forehead, uh, can inhibit impulses that spring from more evolutionarily ancient parts of the brain so that you can uh, delay gratification. If the choice is between a yummy dessert now and um, two pounds heavier on the scale tomorrow, the frontal lobes help you say, forego the pleasure now, get the greater pleasure tomorrow morning on the scale. So those are some of the parts of the brain that are involved. Let's get some phone calls in. Glenn Allen, uh, Virginia, your first step. Glenn Allen, please go ahead. I noticed uh, throughout the beginning of the program and up until now you've been using the word change quite a bit. I wrote a little article earlier this year concerning the politicians talking about how much Americans want change. Americans don't really want change. We want all our money back. And I have ways to implement things to do that through what I term creative utilization of information. I'm looking to empower individuals and small businesses with existing technologies to expand and diversify their interests to an unlimited degree. It's something I tested back in the 80s, and it does work, and in the process had some negative experiences, and as a result was written up on the front page of the Wall Street Journal where I even exposed the former high-level federal government bureaucrat. Well, we're going to leave it at that. Thank you. We are talking about more about language, cognitive thought, 
um, not so much about politics. So let's go to Thousand Oaks, California. Thousand Oaks, please go ahead. Are you there, caller? Um, yes, I have a 10-year-old son who was diagnosed by his high school or with his school with auditory processing disorder. Um, my question is, how can you teach him things? Is there a way to teach him? Well, I'm uh, not being a licensed clinician. I probably shouldn't give specific advice, uh, but I would recommend working with a, a clinician. There are programs, uh, some of them implemented on a computer, that try to uh, train children to pay more attention to the subtle aspects of uh, language that ordinarily can slip by, paying attention to the uh, differences between consonants that sound alike, to the order of consonants in clusters of consonants. And uh, even though it might be harder to begin with, uh, if, you have a, if you're in that part of the spectrum, uh, practice can certainly help you along. You are an atheist. Mm -hmm. what, did the atheism come before your work on the brain or after? Uh, I, I can't remember a time at which I really b believed in, in, in God, at least thinking uh, other than just accepting Bible stories as they were narrated. Mm -hmm. So I don't remember any epiphany. Uh, it just was never really part of my world view. And uh, so it naturally... Uh, uh, morphed into an interest in the science of mind and brain. It was never a shock to me that thinking consists of brain cells firing in patterns, uh, that our consciousness is uh, a, a function of our brain activity. To some people, to some readers of How the Mind Works, this was the biggest shock of the book, something that, that I think most brain scientists and cognitive scientists uh, don't even think about because they just walk into the door with a naturalistic view mm -hmm. of, uh, of the mind and brain. You wrote the soul is in fact the information processing activity of the brain, but that was controversial. Uh, yes, and I, I probably wrote that in response to people who first uh, pointed out that was an implication of, that, of this uh, mm -hmm. worldview. Uh, but yeah, and that's not a, uh, it's not a statement of, of, uh, of faith or, or dogma, but it's a result of what we've learned about thought and feeling, namely that there isn't any aspect of it that uh, can't be pinned down to brain function. If you mess with the chemistry of the brain by taking drugs, you can get changes in mood and personality and even perception in the case of hallucinogens. If a part of the brain becomes damaged, a part of the person can become lost. Uh, if you sever the connections between the two cerebral hemispheres for as a, a surgical treatment. It's as if there are two consciousnesses in the same skull. So we just know from countless kinds of brain studies and brain manipulation that that's where uh, consciousness and thought and feeling reside. Uh, uh, pegging off of that, here's an emailer who says, can you describe exactly what happens when one experiences a psychotic break? Why is the mind, what is the mind, why is the mind then unable to recover from this? Or when is it able to recover, unable to recover from it? This is, uh, I guess, uh, uh, I'm not really an expert in, in um, uh, psychopathology, mm -hmm. but I mean, in, in broad outline, uh, there's, uh, there seem to be genetic causes uh, of differences in brain activity, sometimes, or perhaps due to brain structure, because we know that almost all psychiatric uh, disorders are partly heritable. Uh, there seems to be a disruption in some of the neurotransmitter systems, that is, the uh, neurons or brain cells influence each other by releasing little dabs of, of chemicals that seep across a little gap. Uh, and there are complex systems in the brain that regulate the amounts of those different kinds of uh, chemicals. Those seem to be out of whack in some cases of uh, psychosis. It's not true invariably that a person with a psychotic break can never recover. Uh, they'll probably never be indistinguishable from a person who's never had such a break. But there are cases of recovery. Perhaps the mathematician John Nash, portrayed in the movie A Beautiful Mind, would be the most famous example. Uh, not a typical example, but it does happen. Richmond, Virginia, you're next with Stephen Pinker. Go ahead. Richmond, are you there? Please. Hello, my name is Ben Green. My name is Benjamin Green. I'd like to know what is the definition of DNA in regards to IQ and race 
And I'd also like to know if the author familiar with Dr. Charles Murray and Richard J. Harrison. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is um, uh, Hernstein and Murray. 14 years ago, wrote a book called The Bell Curve. Uh, I knew Richard Hernstein, who's one of my uh, graduate school teachers, and I know Charles Murray, uh, who uh, works here in Washington at the American Air Enterprise Institute. The book uh, was, I think the subtitle was uh, Class Structure and Intelligence in American Life, and it was about the underappreciated role of intelligence in many social outcomes. The fact that uh, intelligence uh, predicts outcomes like uh, employment, income, social status, crime, child abuse, statistically, I mean, it's not destiny. Uh, and in one chapter, they uh, then applied it to the, some of the black-white differences in, uh, in America, arguing that the uh, causes of the black-white dis difference in, in outcomes were not 100% environmental, but some mixture of an environment and genetics. That's the, I, I assume that was the uh, what you had in mind when asking about the uh, relevance of DNA to intelligence. My own reading is I'm I was not persuaded by that particular chapter, and that's the chapter that people think was the point of the whole book. Uh, the rest of the book, I mean, putting aside the black-white difference, but just within races, the differences between one white person and another, difference between one black person and another, um, I think there is an influence of uh, uh, intelligence, and I think part of the influence of intelligence is an influence of, of the genes. Uh, so I think that they were closer to the scientific consensus in talking about intelligence in general when they applied it to race differences, and I think they would be the first to agree, the evidence is much more equivocal. And, uh, I, and I have never endorsed that particular chapter, even though uh, there's much else in the book that, I, that I, I did find persuasive. Prescott, Arizona, go ahead. Press Castle in Ohio? Go ahead. Okay. Um, Hi, I wonder if we could retreat from uh, anthropocentrism uh, just a little bit. And uh, Dr. Pinker, you mentioned very early on in the conversation uh, we needed to be smart to survive. I was just wondering, and I'm also hoping Connie will let me sneak in a second question here. I was just wondering, your definition of intelligence, how far, if you will accept the term, down, uh, would you say that it goes? Does it, would it go to microorganisms or even to information carried by a, a quantum of energy, for example? And is it just a, an accretion process that we eventually identify? And, and how far up to something, if you'll accept that term, to something like artificial intelligence uh, of the kind that Ray Kurzweil might talk about in reverse engineering of the brain? And just sort of put parameters on your definition of intelligence. And I do have one other question. Okay. Uh, I, I certainly wouldn't define intelligence in a way that would restrict it to humans as so some kind of species show, chauvinism. Uh, if you want to understand what human intelligence is, you've got to have some independent idea of what it means to be intelligent. Roughly, I would say that intelligence is the ability to uh, achieve uh, goals in, in uh, multiple ways. That is, uh, if there's uh, a system has to be goal-oriented for intelligence even to apply to it. And that's why I think just information of the kind that could be carried by electrons or quanta doesn't itself count as information unless you, uh, as intelligence, unless you do something with it to get something. Uh, if you can get to that something by multiple routes, uh, then that, I think, corresponds with what we mean by intelligence. William James had a wonderful passage where he said, what's the difference between, say, Romeo uh, approaching Juliet and iron filings approaching a magnet? Uh, why, why do we say one of them is intelligent and the other one's not? And he said, well, imagine that um, a uh, wall was put between Romeo and Juliet. Well, Romeo and Juliet wouldn't idiotically press their lips against opposite sides of the wall the way uh, iron filings in a magnet would if there's a card between them. Romeo would find some other way of getting to Juliet by going around the wall or over the wall or knocking down the wall. Uh, that is, he'd use different courses of action, all uh, united by the fact that they bring about the same goal. So by that standard, uh, many other organisms are intelligent. I don't think humans are the only intelligent organism, although we're probably the most intelligent. But you can see that when uh, you know, dogs and cats and rats and so on can adapt their behavior flexibly to attain something that they want. I think there's a kind, in, in microorganisms, I think they're not intelligent uh, because 
there are fixed mechanical rules, ways of getting a uh, goal. Uh, but one could say that there's a kind of intelligence in there, um, uh, in the way that, that evolution put them together, and that uh, in the same way that the process of evolution can give rise to signs of design in uh, physical structures, it could in behavioral repertoires as well. Uh, but okay, so Can follow up, Ohio. Follow, next question. Um, <clears throat> yes, well, he didn't quite get to the AI, but my, my second question well, think, had to do with. Uh, I can answer that. Yeah, I think uh, there's nothing that, in principle, that would prevent uh, a, uh, a, a human made system from being intelligent. And in fact, in many ways, our computers already are intelligent. Well, my second question did have to do with Francis Crick, who I believe uh, in the years before he passed was trying to use vision as, a, if you will, a rabbit hole to the study of consciousness. And if you had any thoughts on his late work. Yeah, I think that was a, a, an ingenious research strategy. I mean, how do you study consciousness? In particular, his goal was the neural correlates of consciousness. What happens in the brain that corresponds to being aware of something? And he suggested, quite uh, reasonably, that vision would be a good way of getting at it because when, uh, when we see something, that's a very concrete instance of being conscious of it. And I see it, it's red, it's square, uh, it's four feet away. Uh, and then there are, so there are tricks that a neuroscientist can use to find out what process in the brain corresponds to that. And an example being uh, the phenomenon of what's called binocular rivalry. If you have one thing shown to one eye and another thing shown to the other eye, an example is if you take a, a uh, tube of paper, uh, roll a paper into a tube, and then look at your hand through the tube through one eye while keeping the other eye open then what will happen is uh, you'll see your hand through the tube and then it will disappear and it'll look as if there's a hole in your hand. Then the hole will fill in, then it will disappear uh, and fill in again and so on. That's because your brain is having trouble merging the two very different images coming from the two eyes into a single percept. Well, this, is a, this has been known in psychology for 100 years, but uh, Crick and many others noted, well, that's a great way to study consciousness because the information coming in from the two eyeballs is the same. The experience of the whole person uh, fluctuates. A few seconds hand, few seconds whole, few seconds hand, few seconds whole. If you can find what part in the brain changes when the guy says, oh, now it's a whole, and then changes back when he says, now it's a hand, you're getting at the part of the brain that must register the contents of consciousness as opposed to just the raw data coming in from the eyeballs. Even better, you can do it with monkeys because monkeys can be trained to uh, flip a lever every time what they're seeing changes. And you can actually implant electrodes in the monkey's brain, something you can't do with humans, to find out what's changing in the monkey's brain when the monkey's experience changes. So I think it's a, it's a terrific research program, and it's shed a lot of light on what goes on in the brain that makes us conscious. Where, in your opinion, is the best research done in your field? Oh, it's na nowadays, uh, one of the glories of the American uh, research system is that it's distributed over many, many universities. So it's not just the government anymore? Or was it uh, ever just the government? It you know, it probably never was the government. Uh, but it used to be often private labs uh, mm -hmm. that were, it used to be, in the 19th century, it would be kind of English country gentlemen like Darwin uh, puttering around in his greenhouse. Uh, now, since the Second World War, the federal government has uh, um, paid for basic research, and it's at hundreds of, uh, of, of universities all over the world. Now, this is the kind of... Uh research that sometimes gets the, the front page headlines as being not a, a good thing. We're, we're spending X million of dollars looking at such and such uh, behavior in chimpanzees. When you see something <laughs> like, you know, when you see something like that, you go, wait a minute, you know, this oh, is important well, research. Uh, and I, I assume it's okay to, to is it, am I allowed to bring up Sarah Palin? Yeah, you can bring up anything okay. you want, sure. Uh, the most hair-raising egregious, nauseating example of this <laughs> occurred uh, just last week when Sarah Palin ridiculed the idea that the federal government would sponsor research on fruit flies. Mm. She, and then she followed by saying, I kid you not, as if this was the most absurd thing, ignoring the fact that almost everything we know about genetics originally came from research on fruit flies, such as the 
existence and behavior of chromosomes, which is one of the things that allows us to determine the cause of Down syndrome, something that she claims to be um, uh, interested in devoting more resources toward. Uh, so genetics is something you study with fruit flies. Fruit flies are also a, a major economic pest. Huge uh, citrus industry in California and Florida can be threatened by quirks of the behavior of the fruit fly. So in picking what she thought uh, was, uh, sounded like an example of government waste, uh, she was identifying possibly the most uh, important, one of the most important bodies of research in the entire scientific uh, enterprise. Uh, and John McCain uh, did the same thing. In two debates, he ridiculed research on the DNA of bears, uh, of grizzly bears not realizing that nowadays, if you're a biologist, you study DNA. Even if you're a field biologist looking at conservation of endangered species, and grizzly bears are a threatened species, there's a federal mandate to keep track of their numbers, how do you know whether you've seen two grizzly bears or whether you've seen one grizzly bear twice? Well, you snag bits of their hair and you do DNA analysis, and that's how we know how many grizzly bears are out there. In making the cheap shot of, uh, well, I don't know if it's for a paternity test or a crime scene, um, both he and Palin, I think, showed a certain uh, contempt for science that I and many other scientists find uh, deeply disturbing. If you describe any scientific research out of context, you can make it sound uh, silly. Uh, it, I think it's utterly irresponsible for a politician to do that, given how much of the fate of our country and our species is going to depend on uh, basic and applied scientific research. Has Barack Obama did that? Done that? Um, I, no, he has not had any uh, cheap shots about uh, uh, scientific funding. No. Prescott, Arizona. Hello. Hi there. I had a, a twofold question. Uh, where do ADD, ADHD, uh, autism and other disabilities fit in, and how can our educational system be improved to make these people more productive and less marginalized? Uh, again, I'm going to have to speak uh, rather rather vaguely, kind of like politicians, because I'm not a, a clinician or an expert in, in uh, disorders. Um, well, certainly we, we should understand them, uh, all, all of these syndromes, and that does involve research. Um, we should uh, make finer distinctions. Uh, a lot of these are very broad kind of garbage categories where any child who is learning in a slightly different way gets thrown into them, often because of the incentive structure of special education that they get extra attention and extra resources if they're diagnosed as falling into a certain category. So we need better and more honest categories, and also an incentive structure in the schools that it isn't the case that you have to be diagnosed with a, a condition, given a label, in order to get this extra attention. I think perhaps uh, genetics might help us in subdividing what seems to be a, a big rag bag of very different syndromes that all get called uh, autism spectrum disorder or ADHD, that there are probably lots of subtypes that we might be able to differentiate with better genetics research. Uh, and better understanding, I think, just of the basic processes of how all of us learn to read, learn to add. Uh, remember information, make sense of scientific principles, so that we can pinpoint what is being done differently or what's going awry in the um, uh, abnormal cases. I think all too often we give these off-the-shelf tests that just show that something is going wrong without really understanding what it is that's going wrong, partly because we don't understand what goes right when it does go right. So I like to start from a better understanding of how uh, reading and, and math and scientific understanding work in the best in the normal case. Out to the West Coast now, Oregon. Is it Tulip? Is that how you pronounce that? I'm from Puyallup, Washington. Puyallup, go ahead. Um, first off, I'm very glad about his last answer regarding autism spectrum disorder. That made me very happy. I have a 14-year-old girl who is diagnosed with um, PDD NOS in the autism spectrum disorder. And I have an eight-year-old son who was diagnosed as developmentally delayed when he was three. And they have very different brains, and they react to everything completely differently. And I'm fascinated by the genetics because they both came from me, but six years apart. And one is a boy and one is a girl. Now, the boy has a phenomenal memory. He can look at things and memorize them, and three years later, still remember them. My 
daughter, however, cannot make connections and leaps. She cannot remember mathematic facts. She cannot remember what she did last week. She doesn't, you know, make the connections in her brain, and therefore her memory isn't great. But she's in the moment all the time. She lives in a zen kind of environment, and it frustrates my son greatly. Do you have any ideas about, you know, how, why these two are so diametrically opposed from each other and how they both came from me and what we can do to help them communicate better and genetically how they got this way? What are your thoughts on this subject? Well, even full biological siblings only share half of their genes. So when a, uh, a man and woman uh, have children, the reason they don't have a litter of, of clones, a, a litter of uh, identical uh, twins or triplets and so on, is because the genes get reshuffled. So even with the holding parents constant, the kids are going to inherit different combinations of, of uh, genes, different subsets of genes. Secondly, they... Uh, there, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of chance that goes into uh, the wiring of the brain and the forming of the person. There are unique experiences that leave their stamp on a person in ways that we don't understand. There are sex differences. One's a boy, one's a girl. You can't tell with just one of each which of their traits are due to being male and female. But in large samples, you can assess the probabilities. And, and, and there are some differences between boys and girls. Uh, and... Um, uh, since each of them is an individual, it's uh, hard for me not knowing them and not, not being equipped to diagnose them, how to uh, get them to com communicate better. Uh, and um, I don't know if I can offer much more than, than uh, common sense, uh, let them interact, uh, explain to each of them what might be different about the other, and, uh, and, and hope that the natural course of events works out. This emailer from Maine emailed in about, uh, again, twin, mm -hmm. twin daughters, who, when they were young, he says, uh, had a language all their own. They talked to each other. How, have you studied anything? I, I, have, I have studied language development in twins, although mm -hmm. not these private languages, but I, I've done a little bit of reading on them. And in, uh, I think every case that's been studied isn't really a separate language. Uh, with its own words and grammar and so on. It's really a distorted pronunciation of uh, parts of the language that they hear from their parents or babysitters. What happens is when you learn a language, you have to perfect its pronunciation by listening to other people. If you're spending a lot of time with a twin who might have a certain mispronunciation, which you then copy, and then he copies it from you, and you copy it from him, and he copies your copy of his copy, uh, it can sometimes... Um, veer off into an idiosyncratic pronunciation, which typically children outgrow by the time they are uh, they were two or, or three. Um, so it's, it's misleading to call it a different language, but it often sounds like one because the pronunciations are idiosyncratic. Is that the same type of thing? I mean, I know family members have said uh, to me as an adult, you know, you say that just like your mother did, and I hadn't lived with my mother for 25 or 30 years. And, no. You know, it, it, do, we, do we keep those kinds of memories of things that are said to us in the way they're said to us? Generally, no, because accents are much more likely to conform to your peer group than your parents. Mm -hmm. And anyone who moves from, say, England to the U.S. or vice versa, or from the Deep South to California, finds that the kids don't end up speaking like them. They speak, they're indistinguishable from their, uh, their classmates. So generally, we, we don't. Uh, we're, we're so attuned when we're kids to uh, how other kids talk uh, that that's, that's what we glom on to. Next is San Francisco. Hello. Hello. Uh, thanks, Connie T. Stan, for taking my call. Sure. Professor Pinker, earlier in the conversation, uh, you were speaking about empty rhetoric. And I wanted to ask you about words that simultaneously activate multiple frames. Uh, there's a cognitive scientist at Berkeley, George Lakoff, who writes about um, concepts that have uncontested cores and then they have contested conclusions or contest contested specificity. And I wanted to ask you, um, perhaps if you could talk about any examples of words or concepts that you've observed that are used in politics that sort of maybe apparently seem like throwaway language or empty rhetoric, but functionally they're words that are used sort of as double agents to try to speak to two or more sides of the electorate in different ways. And if you mm -hmm. could broader than that, talk about George Lakoff's uh, theories and how you have reacted and responded to them over the years. Yes, well, Lakoff's a very uh, 
uh, influential and distinguished linguist and cognitive scientist, and, and he's certainly been an influence on, uh, on a lot of my thinking. In uh, The Stuff of Thought, I have a chapter called The Metaphor Metaphor, largely influenced by Lakoff's work on how much of everyday speech is metaphorical without people even realize they, realizing that they're using metaphors. If I say our language is saturated with metaphor, well, saturated, it's like language is a sponge and its constructions are a kind of liquid. If I say, well, I uh, sometimes, I've sometimes fought with Lakoff, uh, you know, I, I attacked his book and he defended himself, I'm using the metaphor of argument, intellectual argument being kind of warfare. It's almost hard to find any example of language that is not metaphorical, and that must tell us something about how the mind works. Um, Lakoff has written a, a, a number of books exploring that idea and applying it to politics. I think he goes much too far, but while acknowledging that he's shed a, an awful lot of light on, uh, on, on human cognition in this way. Uh, in terms of particular examples, well, Lakoff chose the example of freedom in a book that I didn't much care for, but, uh, but nonetheless made the significant point that freedom has different meanings to different people in different parts of the spectrum. Uh, for the, the um, say, the civil liberties-minded center-left uh, and, and libertarians, it involves things like sexual orientation, uh, choice in, in media, the, the uh, ability to not have uh, entertainment censored, uh, to um, Economic libertarians it involves the uh, ability to start a business and to run it unfettered by government regulations. Um, to others, it just involves an uh, opposition to to uh, tyranny and uh, dictatorship, and it's a license for spreading democracy at the point of a gun to other countries, such as uh, Iraq. So, uh, one word and one concept can actually be qu quite divisive when you start to uh, implement it. The other example Change. you used in the book is taxes. Uh, taxes is another example. Um, uh, Professor Lakoff suggested that uh, some of the stigma against taxes that uh, conservative politicians have exploited can be um, lifted if you refer to taxes as um, like, uh, membership fees, uh, which I think has a certain tin ear to what what kind of euphemism will actually work on people, and I think it would immediately become a target of ridicule. So I don't think it's particularly astute uh, political advice. Although the more general point, I think, is valid, namely that the art of rhetoric and persuasion does consist often in framing the same concept in, in different ways. Hence, I mean, there are many examples when the movement to outlaw abortion was called pro-life, uh, the movement to keep abortion legal and available is called pro-choice, where choice is something that, you know, who could be against choice if you're a, a Democrat in favor of, uh, of, of freedom, small d Democrat, that is. And so, but on the other hand, who could be against life? So each side uh, picks one aspect of the phenomenon that is very hard to be uh, opposed to and uses that as the brand for their political uh, movement. Probably just about anything that you anything that serves as a catchword or a tagline for a political campaign can have these opposite meanings. Change being the most obvious example in this particular campaign. Melville, New York. Hello. Hello. Um, good afternoon. Uh, I'm reading a book, Life After Death, The Burden of Proof by Deepak Chopra. And I'm wondering, uh, one of the premises of the book, uh, The Burden of Proof, is... Um, I guess to prove the existence of a, a superior being, a mind, um, God. Um, and he does cite some examples um, in neuro, um, neurological research about uh, putting the mind before the brain or the brain, uh, as the brain as the controller of the mind. And I'm wondering uh, what you think about uh, that, both of those philosophies. Mm -hmm. Well, the, uh, I, I don't believe that there is any uh, mind that's separate from the operation of the brain. So I think the studies that uh, look at people who, say, have near-death experiences and uh, have common accounts of what they experience as supposedly the soul leaves the body can all be explained in terms of the effects of oxygen deprivation on the brain, the kind of hallucinations that you have uh, when the visual cortex is deprived of uh, oxygen, and I don't think that any accounts of a person 
uh, ceasing brain function and then being revived and then being able to remember conversations that took place when there, there was no brain activity. I don't think any of those have uh, panned out. They all turn out to be uh, false reports, uh, cases where it would be very easy to reconstruct it after the fact. So um, I would have to disagree with the premise of the book. I haven't read it, but assuming that it's that mind can exist separately from brain, then I think the evidence is very strongly uh, against that. I mean, the mind can affect the brain in the sense that um, the whole operation of the entire brain, which is very densely and richly interconnected, can affect certain parts of the brain. The mind can affect the uh, because mind in the sense of what my 100 billion neurons are doing can affect the body because the brain's connected to the spinal cord, which is connected to the hand. So I don't think that mind and brain are, or mind and body are separate in the sense of not being able to interact. But I don't think there's anything called mind that somehow floats free of the, uh, of the brain. Cardston, is that Alberta, Canada? Yes. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I, did I lose you? No, oh. you're there. Go ahead. Okay. I have a question about the colonization of language because uh, I'm working on the Blood Indian Reserve in southern Alberta where Blackfoot was the original language children were kidnapped and forced to speak English under, under stress. And now we're at a point where the language is in danger, the original language is in danger. And I'm wondering if um, there's any specific uh, sort of sociolinguistic crossover, science, social science um, aspects that you're familiar with sir, um, regarding that colonization process and then the recovery of the original language in terms of influences. Thank you. I'll hang up now. Yes, it, it's a very pressing issue for linguistics because uh, our subject matter is disappearing. There are estimated to be about 6,000 languages spoken on uh, Earth today, and uh, at least half of them are uh, endangered in the sense of they'll, they probably won't last another few decades. How do we know that? Well, all the people who speak them are in their 70s or 80s, and this is certainly true of many uh, Native American and, and, and uh, First Nation Canadian languages. Um, it, it could be that as many as 90% of them go extinct. Um, that still leaves 600 languages. It's not as if everyone's going to end up speaking English or Chinese. But it still is um, a, a tra scientific tragedy and a, and a cultural tragedy because each language is this exquisite, uh, like a work of art, like, an, like a, a species. Uh, and each language also is the medium by which a culture is, uh, is transmitted. Uh, it's often the uh, language is a repository of a lot of humor, imagery, metaphor. Uh, on the other hand, and many languages have gone extinct because of coercive uh, policies of uh, governments such as Australia, Canada, and the U.S. Although, to be honest, a lot of them are, are doomed uh, regardless of what government policy is, simply because um, nowadays we're becoming more interconnected. Opportunity lies in mastering a, uh, the language of the majority country, and there's less incentive of keeping these uh, languages uh, alive. And I'm as guilty as, as anyone, like many grandchildren of uh, immigrants. Um, my grandparents survived speaking Yiddish. My parents spoke it um, not as well as my grandparents, at least in the case of my mother. Uh, I don't speak it at all. Why? Uh, well, I don't really need Yiddish to, to survive. I'm sorry that I didn't learn it, but the way I grew up gave me few opportunities to learn it, and that's an experience that is replicated worldwide. So the, I, I think what we can do is certainly do our best to document these languages before they vanish forever. Uh, they're useful not just to linguists, but even to archaeologists and anthropologists and historians tracing the history of migrations of peoples uh, for whom language is often the best set of evidence, kind of fossil evidence of where people have been and who they've interacted with. Uh, we know that the uh, gypsies, for example, uh, or the, the Roma, as they're now called, originated in India because their language, Romani, is closely tied to uh, Indian languages. The other thing is, of course, to not get in the way of efforts by people to speak and preserve their own languages, to uh, assist them in keeping it alive if there are the numbers and if there is the commitment uh, to, to do so. Allenson, Michigan. One more call, then we'll take a break. Go ahead. Allenson, you're on the air. Please go ahead. 
Hello. Um, what I wanted to ask Professor Pinker was um, if uh, his books covered, since I've not read his books, but I have listened to him on television a number of times and am planning to read him. Um, I read an article years ago by Douglas Hofstadter um, in which he explores mental chunking and what he calls triggerable analogies. And I found it fascinating. And I'm wondering, I'm sure that um, Professor Pinker has covered these ideas um, that um, it's actually analogy um, that makes thought and reasoning possible and not the other way around. And I'm wondering which of his books he would recommend that I read um, to learn more about this. Um, and then I have a second quick question, which is, what does he do for fun uh, that doesn't involve a great deal of thought? <laughs> mental um, chunking, huh? Mental chunking. Yes, I, I, uh, I'm very sympathetic to the suggestion from uh, Douglas Hofstadter. And in fact, I'm engaged in a research project right now with a, my graduate student, James Lee, on um, analogical reminding, a phenomenon that Hofstadter himself uh, documented and that I've experienced uh, a lot, and write about in my most recent book, The Stuff of Thought, that has an extensive discussion of the role of analogy in human thought. We talked about it a little bit in, in um, discussing unconscious metaphor. So the first person who said he attacked my argument must have been struck by what a, a verbal disagreement has in common with a physical assault. Namely, in both cases, there's a conflict of goals, there's an action by one party that um, uh, in, in some way works to the disadvantage of another, it can be defended against, and so on. And so that must have shaped our language when the word attack and defend got transferred from the realm of warfare to the realm of argument. What is the mental process that allows that to happen? Well, that can leap must be something that happened to someone at a particular time and then eventually gets contagious and spreads through the language. So I've been trying to f figure out how often these leaps occur to people. And I started just by studying myself, as many psychologists do, and I noticed that every once in a while, out of nowhere, one experience would remind me of another. They have nothing in common in terms of their uh, sensory experience. It's not like, like Marcel Proust writing about uh, sipping the lime tea and being time transported back to his childhood when he sipped the lime tea. These are cases of reminding where the similarity is purely by analogy. So I'll give you an example. Um, I go jogging, I have my iPod, um, lots of songs in the iPod, some of them are slow, some of them are fast. Uh, of course when you jog you want something with the right tempo. So, and, and you can't both jog and, and select songs at the same time. So I let it the, uh, the iPod picked the song, and if it's the wrong tempo, I just skip over it. I go skip, 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 ah, and there's one that I can jog to. Immediately I thought of how in baseball, the uh, pitcher and catcher communicate by the catcher uh, signaling pitches uh, with finger signs, and then the pitcher shaking them off until he gets one that he likes. Now, that's, in one sense, it's a bizarre association. What does uh, songs on an iPod have to do with with throwing pitches, on the other hand, there is a very deep commonality between them, namely a case in which you can't directly pick something that you want, you wait for a selection, and you reject them until you get the one that you want. Somehow, my brain categorized those two experiences in terms of that analogy that they share. And I do agree with, uh, with Douglas Hofstadter that that is a, a very important mental process in allowing us to come to scientific discoveries, literary metaphors, figures of speech, like argument is war, that then enrich the language. Uh, and I'm trying to find out uh, how often and how easily it happens and, and to which people. And what do you do for fun? Oh, what do I do for fun? <laughs> yes, uh, aside from jogging with an iPod. Uh, I like the, um, uh, I do a lot of reading. Well, I guess that counts as, as uh, doing stuff with, with your mind. I like uh, outdoor activity that involves getting from one place to another on, on uh, people power. Uh, I like hiking, I like uh, bicycling, mountain biking, tandem biking, uh, road, road biking. I like kayaking, uh, I like jogging. So anything where you do some exercise and, and scenery goes by, uh, and, enjoy. And after our break, we're going to take a look at some of your photography. Oh, and photography. We're going to take, a, take a, a quick break. We'll be back with many more of your phone calls. For me, a good day of writing is one where I can do it 
absolutely intensively from uh, right after breakfast until I go to bed with a, a break for exercise, especially if it's a nice day, spending some time with uh, Rebecca, my wife. But otherwise, uh, I, I like to work intensely. I can't work on a book just an hour or two a day. Uh, I find that I have to uh, have a bunch of ideas in the air at the same time, kind of like a, a juggler. And then if I have to put them down and get them all up in the air again, then uh, it's quite disruptive. And for that reason, I like to write every day, uh, all day, for weeks or months at a time, uh, whenever I can get away with it. I'm not a, a much of a morning person, so I probably don't start until uh, 10 a.m. I'll, I'll take a short break for lunch, then um, an hour or two before sunset, I'll go uh, running or bicycling, or if I'm uh, in Cape Cod, uh, kayaking. Um, and then after a, a nice dinner with Rebecca, I'll, I'll often get back to work. Uh, it helps that, that uh, my other half, Rebecca Goldstein, is also a, a writer. She's written more books than I have. So she not only understands the lifestyle, but she's likely to be working on a book herself at the same time. So, uh, so we're, we're always in sync. I, I do uh, an enormous amount of reading before I uh, actually put words down on the screen. Uh, for the book that I'm working on right now, for example, I'll have read for uh, almost a year solid before even uh, writing. Uh, just familiarizing mm -hmm. myself with the background, especially in fields that I was not trained in. I'm an experimental psychologist, so when I need to write on psychology uh, or in linguistics, a field in which I've also uh, been trained, then I can read what I have to read and know how to interpret it and uh, write about it. But when my writing verges on areas that uh, I wasn't originally trained in, like evolutionary biology, or history, or legal theory, or uh, brain science, then I have to feel that I'm, uh, that I'm thinking like a brain scientist, or thinking like a historian, or thinking like a, an evolutionary biologist before I start to write. I have to read enough papers from opposing viewpoints within a field that I get a feel for what the controversies are, so that when I read a claim in that field, I'll have the, 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 the red flags and the suspicions and the skepticism that a practitioner in that field would have. You can only develop that sensibility by reading the controversies to get a lay of the land. On my first pass, when I'm just familiarizing myself with a, uh, an area, uh, taking the notes and organizing them would be more trouble than, than, than it w it's worth. I do make extensive marginalia, uh, both on the pages and in the front and back covers. Then, and that, this is just getting myself acquainted with an area of research. Then when it actually comes time to writing, then I will go over the sources again, and I will make extensive notes keyed to actual page numbers. Uh, I find uh, through, through bitter experience that uh, memory for passages, and worse, rendering of quotes is shockingly error prone. That uh, when you're, even when you're typing a quote from a book right next to you, it is very easy to get a word or two or punctuation wrong. And so I've forced myself to go back to the quotes to make sure that every semicolon is exactly as it was in the original. But organizing material is one of the, the big challenges in preparing for a book, especially since I like to illustrate abstract academic ideas with real-world examples, with cartoons, with song lyrics, with uh, snatches of dialogue from movies, uh, not as a, a way to um, just sort of tart up the prose or to wake up a, a reader in the midst of a uh, boring discussion, but rather because the things that I'm interested in are things that play themselves out in everyday life. We all uh, uh, live by language. We, uh, uh, when I write about humor, uh, it helps to be able to give examples of some funny things. When I write about conversation, to give uh, dialogue from movies. When I write about violence, to have 
actual examples from the newspapers or the history books. So I, even when I'm not working on a book, I will am amass a collection of psychologically relevant bits of culture. If I see a cartoon that makes some interesting point, even if I don't know when or whether I'll ever write a book about it, I'll file it in a file that I have of, uh, of, of psychology cartoons. And These are the ones for language. How long have you been doing this? Uh, since I was a graduate student. Um, and this one's actually on a, on a comic on free will. I've never actually used that. But it's got a, uh, it's from Monty, and it's <coughs> got a space alien who has a prognosticator that can predict the future actions of any individual. So you have different categories. Taboo? Yeah, taboo. I've got uh, cartoons. Uh, for irregular past tense forms, uh, believe it or not. I have little examples. It, uh, it will not only affect your kids, but your kids as kids. I heard that in a documentary on arts and entertainment on the real Aaron Brockovich, March 15th, 2000, said by Nola Wetterman, resident. So that, that's just a little linguistic example. Oh, Father of West's Jackalope. We just throwed the we just throwed the dead jack rabbits in the shop when we came in and it slid on the floor right up against a pair of deer horns. That's the origin of the jackalope, but for me, the fact that he used throwed rather than threw is something that I <laughs> right, that uh, I wanted to be able to explain. I'll get on language. Uh, so we've got a big dog up in the sky saying, well, yes, considering you people have been spelling my name backwards all the time, I imagine this would come as a bit of a surprise to you. <laughs> so, <laughs> on how they, uh, you can't predict the meaning of a word from the uh, meaning of the individual letters that make it up. So for just about any topic, I've got a, I've got a cartoon somewhere. Oh, I like this one. I'm not sure what this is apropos of. See, the problem with doing things to prolong your life is that all the extra years come at the end when you're old. <laughs> <laughs> then often when I start working on a book, I'll uh, go through all of my interesting, topical, uh, humorous examples to see which of them will, uh, will, will fit in. Uh, now that's just, and that's just for clippings. For books, um, in articles, I also, um, articles I will also clip out, and I have both physical files in a f file cabinet and uh, computer files. For my most recent book, I try to have electronic copies of every article that I uh, will cite. For articles of the last 10 years, that's easy, because they're published in the academic journals in electronic form and in newspapers. For earlier ones, I have an assistant scan them in, and they make PDFs so that, uh, and, and I'll have a hard copy. Hard copy is easier to mark up and to spread them all, all on a desk as opposed to crowding them into a little computer screen. But then sometimes I need to search them, search for snippets of text, and for that it really helps to have the electronic copy as well. I actually learned this from a, one of my graduate students. He said that he didn't have a file cabinet full of reprints, uh, that all of his articles were on his laptop. And I, uh, you often learn from technology from younger people who've grown up with it. It never occurred to me that a computer disk would be big enough to store the equivalent of, of several file drawers of articles. But of course, now as disks have become cheaper and bigger, it is feasible to keep your entire scholarly library of reprints on your computer. Uh, but for me, I, I try to have both. Uh, for books, uh, in many cases, you have no choice but to get books out of, the, uh, of a university library. But I, I like to, to own books when I can. And so I, I do the one click on the online uh, bookstores. And I have almost a daily delivery of, uh, from the UPS guy who's come to know me from all of my uh, deliveries from the online bookstores. I like to be able to mark them up. I like to be able to go back to them uh, if I read something that I've written uh, on a subsequent draft, and I wonder if I got it right the first time, or I want to fact check. And uh, it would take me much, much longer if for every book I would have to retrieve it from the library. Fortunately, with paperbacks and, and with used books, which are easily accessible uh, in online sites, it's not so hard to keep a, a, an extensive personal library. I rely on uh, rewriting and rewriting and rewriting. 
um, my books will have go through anywhere from five to six drafts. <coughs> what I'll do is I'll put down uh, material in a first draft, and I, I write from beginning to end of a chapter. I, I don't, I, I, I dislike having placeholders like get back to this and fill it in later. <coughs> so I try to go from beginning to end. Uh, then I'll take one more pass because inevitably that first pass will be choppy. There'll be missing transitions. There'll be unclear passages, passages that I know are unclear because I may not understand them <laughs> uh, a month later, having just written them. Uh, so then I'll polish that that um, chapter draft. So it'll be draft number two. Then I'll go on to the next chapter. So everything goes through two drafts. Then I'll share chapters with uh, colleagues. I, who have expertise in what I'm writing about to get their feedback, so they point out the more embarrassing errors. Um, then I'll put the whole book through uh, another draft. Uh, typically then send it to my editor uh, at the, the publisher, get her comments or his comments, um, and then we'll um, put it through two, two more drafts. Again, a chapter, then back to the beginning of the chapter to smooth and polish what I just wrote. And then I'll take one more pass through the entire book from beginning to end to sand down the rough edges, to make early parts consistent with later parts, uh, just to feel good about the quality of the prose uh, of the whole thing. And this doesn't count, by the way, the other drafts subsequent to that that I do when I get it back from the copy editor who goes over every last comma and, and italics and will also will often give me feedback of passages that she doesn't understand or that she disagrees with or that she thinks are badly expressed. So, so uh, in, the, in the end, it's actually even more than six drafts. And we're back with Steven Pinker, cognitive scientist, author of many books. Let's talk a little bit about you, where you grew up. Montreal, Quebec. And how did your family get there? My grandparents came from Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. They were uh, Jewish immigrants. They came to Canada in the 1920s. Uh, two of my grandparents came from Krasnostov, Poland, in the uh, eastern part of Poland, which I actually went back to visit with my parents and my wife, uh, Rebecca, uh, three years ago. So I sort of went to the an ancestral Pinker homeland. Uh, my mother's parents came respectively from Warsaw and from uh, Moldova, Kishinev, uh, Moldova. Uh, they came to Canada in the 1920s, I suspect because the immigration laws changed in 1924 in the United States. And Canada was kind of the closest you could get to New York when they wouldn't let, let Jews into New York anymore. Um, so where did you go to school? I went to school in the, I went to uh, elementary and high school in the English-speaking segment of Montreal. Mm -hmm. uh, Montreal was pretty linguistically segregated when I grew up, which is why, uh, to my shame, I'm not bilingual in, in uh, English and French. Then I, I left for graduate school in uh, 1976 after having gotten my bachelor's degree from McGill University in Montreal. So at the age of 22, I moved to uh, the Boston area, and I've pretty much lived there ever since, except for a couple of years in California. Uh, do you have Canadian citizenry or American? I, have, uh, I, I became an American citizen about 14 years ago. I, I couldn't stand not being able to vote. How, what kind of, uh, how, what, what are your siblings like? Who are they? Oh, my um, sister Susan is three years younger than me, and she's also an author. She's a, a, a Canadian journalist who has a column in the uh, Globe and Mail, one of Canada's national newspapers, and recently wrote a book called The Sexual Paradox on the different career trajectories of uh, uh, boys and girls when, when they become men and women. Mm -hmm. uh, my brother Rob, uh, my sister's name is Susan, my brother Rob is a policy analyst for the Canadian government. He lives in Ottawa and he uh, works with the Privy Council, the uh, advisory body to the Canadian government. And are your parents still alive? My parents are, are still alive. My father, Harry, uh, who just turned 80, is uh, retired, but he worked as a lawyer and as a uh, in real estate and in in sales and various combinations mm -hmm. in various times in his life. Uh, my mother was uh, a high school guidance counselor, and uh, they called her Pink the Shrink, 
uh, and then uh, became the vice principal of the high school, also retired. You, read, you wrote someplace about the, the fact that your parents had kind of midlife career changes and what impact that had on you. They, they did. I, my mother, like many women of her generation, uh, did not have a career, got a bat early on, got a, her bachelor's degree and immediately contributed to the baby boom in the 1950s, uh, and then got understandably um, restless and her, her great talents were, were not being uh, uh, put to use and uh, uh, explored her options and in the 1970s went back, got a master's degree and then a job as a, uh, as a guidance counselor. But was always intellectually voracious, uh, read, was fantastically informed, um, much engaged in not just current events but uh, abstract intellectual ideas, philosophy, science, uh, probably in, if she'd been born in another generation, uh, she would, would also have been a, a writer or a, a, a scholar. But as it is, she was a very uh, much beloved uh, vice principal and guidance counselor. And in fact, all over the world I give uh, talks and people come up to me and they were students of, uh, pink former the students shrink. of uh, Pink the Shrink, and, uh, <laughs> later Pink the vice principal. And um, your own father, family, are you married? I'm sorry, go ahead, yeah, your father. My father uh -huh. um, uh, my father uh, got a law degree, uh, didn't practice at first, um, but then decided uh, after a successful career in um, running uh, apartments and motels and uh, decided to uh, reopen a law practice in his, uh, I think, uh, when he turned 50. And then uh, had a many years of uh, practicing law before he retired. So there's hope for us, right? <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> and your own family. I am um, married to uh, yet another writer, Rebecca Goldstein, who is a novelist and a philosopher. Who's written six books of fiction and uh, two nonfiction books. One, one of them on uh, a biography of Baruch Spinoza, the, the great philosopher. Another of, of Kurt Gödel, the brilliant mathematician. Uh, and I have two um, stepdaughters. Uh, uh, Yael, yet another writer, who's uh, a novelist, who's Yael Goldstein Love, whose book uh, The Passion of Tasha Darsky just came out in paperback, and uh, Danielle, who is a, um, a, a poet. Uh, uh, is writing genetic? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> uh, verbal, verbal skill probably does have a heritable, partly heritable basis, but that would not be enough to predict that, that a writer would necessarily have a child who's a, a writer or in, inclined towards writing. But yeah, I think um, a facility with language does have a heritable basis. If people go to your website, they can find your photography. When did you get interested in photography, and is there any kind of combina or any kind of uh, combination of what you do in terms of your research in language and, and photography? Not as much in, in language. I've been I, I've enjoyed photography since I was a child, and but first really became serious uh, in it about uh, uh, 14 years ago. Uh, there's more of a connection in my interest in visual cognition, mm -hmm. in um, how do we perceive depth and color and shape and form. Uh, what is a change in perspective due to our experience in a scene? And in fact, my PhD thesis was not on language, but on imagery for three-dimensional uh, uh, scenes. Uh, photography also has a, a, some connection to human evolution, because there are some scenes that we find more attractive than others. Uh, I remember as a child getting my first book on How to Guide on Photography. It was published by Kodak. And I was intrigued by something that they mentioned in, in this book. They said that in Kodak Labs, which at the time, way before digital, people would send their negatives to Kodak and their prints would come back in the mail. And they said that of the shots that they process, they fought, felt, most of them fell into a small number of categories. I think they said that, that photographs with bodies of water were more than half of the uh, snapshots they got. There were also babies and family members, um, animals uh, and scenes of uh, mountains, trees, flowers, uh, sunsets. Now that says something. Given that there isn't anything, you can't eat a sunset, you can't eat a flower, uh, why, why should these be visually fascinating to us? Uh, and I think it ties in part to the kind of ecosystem that humans are adapted to, namely with 
bodies of water, with greenery, with trees, with fruit, with flowers. If you're a, an ancestral human and you've got to, you're wandering the landscape and you have a choice of places to, to live, if you live in that one, that augurs best for your, your, your health and, and well-being. And I think that's reflected in our, in our visual tastes. Okay. That's kind of intellectualizing a hobby, maybe a bit too much. <laughs> but you do a lot <laughs> of nature photography. I do nature photography. Is nature is my favorite subject mm -hmm. to, to photograph, yeah. So back to um, your work, and I have this uh, email from David Almanger in Dallas, Texas. He says he's currently reading The Blank Slate and that you address the issue of violence there. He says, as a counselor who, is, uh, who has worked with uh, court order defenders over 10 years, I'm constantly thinking about the root cause of violence in our society. Could you please expound on the issue? And how has the concept of violence evolved over centuries? And can this understanding help us in the reduction of violence among humans? Oh, what a great question, <laughs> because it's the topic of my, my next book, oh. uh, that, that very question. Uh, it, violence, obviously, is a complex phenomenon. There isn't one cause of violence. There are people who are violent for a number of reasons. One of them is just sheer predatory violence. You want something that the other guy has, you, you steal it from him, you get rid of him if he resists. Or she, if, in the case of, of uh, sexual violence. There's also moralistic violence. An awful lot of violence people do because they think it's morally justified to punish someone for something. Uh, he, genocides are often uh, instigated to uh, on, uh, as some kind of payback or revenge for some perfidy you think that a, an, a, another group has visited on your group. Um, there's also just sheer um, macho boastful violence to establish that you're formidable enough that other people don't want to mess with you. You prove it by showing that you can get away with violence. So just in this last 60 seconds I've given three different causes of violence and, and there are probably others. What drove you to that as your next book topic? Well, part of it is um, <coughs> in both The Blank Slate and How the Mind Works, I talked about human violence as, as a, uh, something that grows out of human nature, in particular out of male nature. Men, the biggest risk factor mm -hmm. for violence is, uh, is being male by, by a long shot. Violence is largely a guy thing. Uh, it's often concentrated in a certain uh, span of the uh, lifetime, mainly between in the teens and 20s. It, it tends to flourish in male-only environments, like frontier regions. It tends to flourish in the absence of third-party enforcers, like in zones of anarchy, in, in inner-city um, drug rings, in mountainous regions beyond the reach of the law. Uh, for all that, uh, for all of the ways in which violence grows out of, uh, of human nature, we also see through history that it has gone down. Most people are astonished to hear this claim, that uh, by many measures we're living in more peaceable times now than in all of human history. Rates of homicide in all Western countries have plummeted since from what they were a few hundred years ago. Uh, war between major nations is, um, uh, might be a thing of the past between developed major powers. We don't have as many forms of gruesome mutilation and torture and capital punishment as you would find in England a few hundred years ago, and many other uh, ways in which we've got, become, become nicer. This hasn't been a biological change, or at least most of it couldn't have been, because it's just too recent. A lot of it is just in the last 60 years. Uh, so what, has, what allows us to live more peaceably, even though I think we still have some of these violent uh, inclinations, which we see in our taste in entertainment. Entertainment is as bloody as ever, um, but we do less of it in real life. It's that paradox that I want to explore in, in the next book, which I call The Better Angels of Our Nature. The Better Angels of Our of Nature? Our nature. Are, is this being based on original research or research done over the years? Already done? Uh, over the years. This mm -hmm. is, I'm going to be kind of sitting high on the food chain, relying on statistics gathered by others on a realm of uh, domains of violence, everything from frequency of war over time and, and, and casualties per war, to homicide statistics, uh, legal changes like how many countries had legalized slavery at different points in history. So I'm going to try to make sense of that from a psychologist's vantage point, namely, why did people wake up one morning and say, oh, we shouldn't burn heretics to death, or keeping slaves isn't such a great idea. Of course, they didn't wake up one morning. Right. But nonetheless, 
there's a change, sometimes a rapid change, where s slavery is just a labor-saving device to slavery was a moral abomination. Uh, war used to be something that was good for you. It was masculinizing. It improved the vigor of the nation. Now, even people who are in favor of military engagements have to say that it's to eliminate tyranny or some immediate threat. The idea that war is a good thing uh, has, has uh, vanished from our culture. Uh, so how did all these changes take place? That's what I'm currently thinking about. Before we go back to the phones, I want to take a, um, a topic from the Stuff of Thought, your most recent book from last year, and that's obscenity. Oh, and yes. before we talk about it, I would tell our viewers that, that uh, Dr. Pinker is going to use the actual word, so if this is going to be, be uh, troublesome for you, you may want to change channels or do something else. Or turn, down, turn down the sound. Turn down the sound. Maybe okay. that's it. We'll let you know when we come back. But why have a chapter on obscenity? Ah, yes. Uh, well, it's, it's <coughs> as, a, as someone who likes cracking puzzles, mm -hmm. this is a great puzzle of language. Why are certain words, uh, which everyone has heard a zillion times, why do they give offense? Why are they considered immoral? Uh, why do we use them in such all these strange ways? Um, why do so many uh, obscene expressions violate the laws of syntax and semantics? There are lots of linguistic puzzles that uh, are raised by swearing, and I knew that they weren't just linguistics, but they had to tap into some deep feature of human emotion. And so it was a, it was a, great, uh, a great topic, and, and not a whole lot of people have studied it, even though everyone has strong opinions about it. Why don't you give some examples of, of the types of things that you learned in, in taking a look at it and, and some of the uh, origins of some of these words? Yeah. Well, one, anyone who speaks more than one language knows that the, the literal content of swear words varies from language to, to language. So where I grew up in Quebec, in Quebecois French, uh, when you want to shout out something rude, you say, Mozi tabernac, um, a cursed tabernacle. It kind of loses something in translation. And there are languages in which if you were to translate uh, the, the uh, F word, it would be like saying, copulate you. It just it doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. But there are common denominators for all that variation. Generally, taboo words fall into a small number of categories having to do with strong negative emotion. You've got um, uh, words connecting to uh, supernatural powers, like the tabernacle and Carles, chalice, another Quebecois uh, swear word. We have God, damn, hell, Jesus Christ. There are words uh, surrounding sexuality, uh, sexual organs, sexual activities, sexual perversions. Words for excretion, uh, the, the, the substances and the, the body parts. Words for death and disease. Now, we don't have any in uh, English that are actually ta literally taboo, but in Yiddish you can y shout out cholera, cholera. Uh, in, in Dutch, one of the strongest curses is get cancer. And even in English, we have a little bit of taboo around cancer. Uh, it's not a dirty word, but often in obituaries it will say so-and-so passed away from a long illness. You avoid the word die, you avoid the word cancer, almost as if they're almost dirty words. Uh, and then there are also um, uh, taboo words for uh, people and classes of people that your culture doesn't like, for um, uh, cripples, enemies, infidels, despised minority groups, such as the most taboo word in American English today, which is not the F word, nor the S word, but the N word. Uh, and you can get away with saying all kinds of things, but if you were to use the, the word nigger, uh, and not as a linguistic example as I just did, but you call someone that, then you could lose your job. Michael Richards, the uh, comedian who played uh, Kramer, um, his career is almost over because he calls, used the word with some patrons at a comedy club. And when people ask me, uh, have we lost all inhibition against swearing? Because, indeed, a lot of words you hear in polite company now that you would only have heard in the locker room 50 years ago. But there are also lines that, that we still don't cross. Uh, we don't care so much about religion, and so saying God damn is not a big deal. Even sexuality with the sexual revolution is not as taboo as it used to be. On the other hand, race is very, very touchy. Mm -hmm. So Michael Richards got into trouble. Don Imus got into trouble with his comment about nappy-headed hoes both uh, seen as racist and misogynist, and so uh, gender is another hot button, another, another third rail. 
and uh, homophobia. And Coulter, uh, who had a reputation for being outrageous to begin with, much beloved in by her conservative constituency, but when she called uh, John Edwards a faggot, she crossed the line and she got into trouble. So we still have our taboos, and our, but the sensitivities change with, with uh, history. It was interested in what you wrote about the changes in languages and how the, the, the punch of a word can make all the difference in the, uh, in the fact that in French the word merde just doesn't quite have Yes, <laughs> have it as like, uh, it is does in English. Which well, is shit. it's almost more like a, a little more closer to crap. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, it's it's not polite, but it's not taboo. It's not something that you uh, that you, you can rule out. And and you, you see this across many languages uh, that the same concept, even sometimes even the same word. In French, there's the word uh, con, c o n, uh, which uh, not only is no, and, and means kind of stupid or idiot. Uh, not only is there um, uh, is it much more polite than the English equivalent, cunt? But many French speakers are not even aware that it that, that that's the uh, the origin, and that's what happens with a lot of dirty words. People they can become clean as people forget uh, what they originally referred to, and we've in the last couple of decades witnessed that happening with the word sucks, where. In fact, my sister Susan told me a story years ago when her daughter was growing up and she came home from school and she said, uh, oh, Jim really sucked today. And my sister was horrified that an eight-year-old girl was using this, what in her ears was a slang term for fellatio, which is the origin of sucks. But it has become so widespread for just meaning to be bad that people have totally, especially the younger, younger generations, have uh, lost the original image. Stephen Pinker, our guest. Let's get back to your phone calls. Idaho Falls, go ahead. Yes, um, I kind of had a question. You're kind of touching on it with the taboo words, but uh, do we have any trouble in uh, diplomacy if uh, one country like France or, or the Soviet Union has not as uh, a clear a meaning as, say, when our president says something and then the country takes it a completely different way, a more aggressive or more, you know, threatening so that those things are going back and forth between countries not even knowing that the meaning was just not uh, translated correctly. Oh, absolutely. There are many examples of uh, diplomatic um, brouhaha's or worse when a leader's words are, are translated with a slightly different meaning. An example, uh, Khrushchev uh, infamously said, I think it was at the United Nations, uh, the United States, we, we will bury you. Now, that seem to mean we will annihilate you, uh, although probably in the original Russian it meant something more like we will outlive you. That is, we will live long enough to bury you, not that we will kill you and, and inter you. Uh, there's some controversy over what uh, Ahmadinejad meant when he said uh, well, Israel should be wiped off the map, uh, whether that meant outright genocide or, as in Khrushchev's case, meant something like history will, will, um, will show uh, the how viable it is as a society. Um, not to defend Ahmadinejad by any means, but certainly we, uh, it would be very wise for us to know exactly what a foreign leader means, and that requires much more attention, I think, to um, skilled translators of other languages, especially sensitive to the nuance that, that uh, the words have in the original language. And do you think that there are, like there, you said that there are uh, American politicians or lawmakers who use the language, do you think that there are foreign leaders who know how to use the language and the, the difference in the translations to say well, something that they mean, but they, don't, <laughs> but they don't really want to say? Yes, well, um, someone who's very uh, astute in both languages can do that. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it has been a, uh, a, a, a fear of uh, Palestinian negotiating positions, that often they're translated in very conciliatory language, but in the original Arabic and in broadcasts directed uh, at Palestinian audiences, they're much more bellicose. And so uh, that is something we have to be quite mindful of. Illinois is next. Springfield. Hello. Good afternoon. From the home of the better angel, <laughs> who proclaimed that human nature can never change because God decreed it. Steve, on October the 2nd, 2002, you opened your talk on the blank slate with a statement that everyone needs a theory of human nature. Robert Gates, Secretary of Defense, 
alluded to his theory on Tuesday when speaking on the future of nuclear weapons. He claimed that as long as human nature is what it is, we cannot eliminate the need to be prepared for war. What do you think the meaning of is, is here? <laughs> yeah. I, I suspect that um, the, the, the very small grain of truth in that is that I, I doubt we'll ever be in a society where we can uh, eliminate uh, all armies, all police forces. I think, I, I doubt that unilateral, total pacifism uh, could be viable because someone can always pop up who is better armed and, uh, and run you over, and history has many examples of that. On the other hand, I don't think that it means that we will perpetually have, in particular, nuclear weapons. And in fact, uh, I suspect that uh, I'll, I'll probably be dead, but I uh, would not be surprised if, we, if the world eliminates nuclear weapons before using them. Uh, that the, even though probably zero force is not viable, that doesn't say that we have to be armed to, te to, our, to the teeth, especially not with weapons that are as mad as, uh, as nuclear weapons. And again, referring to the, the book that I'm currently working on, you do see reductions in uh, weaponry and war-making ability. We've seen them in, in Europe since the Second World War. We've seen them, in fact, all countries' uh, military budget as a proportion of GDP. Has, uh, has gone down uh, pretty steadily for, for, for many decades. So uh, a, a belief in human nature, including some of the uglier parts of human nature, which I definitely hold, is not incompatible with the desire for greater peace and, uh, and arms reduction, even if it's never to, to zero. Uh, but I, I tend to think, if I were, to, if I were younger, uh, I would put money on nuclear weapons being um, eliminated in... 50 years. Uh, I think it's not crazy. And, and many foreign policy hawks uh, are actually believe that this will happen, or at least think that it's a viable option that we ought to pursue, partly because they're not usable realistically. There's a taboo against using nuclear weapons, even small nuclear weapons that are less destructive than many conventional weapons nations have stayed away from, at least so far. Uh, and as a result, they're militarily just about useless. And with the fear of nuclear proliferation of more and more countries trying to become big boys, entering the big leagues by emulating countries like us, it may happen that, uh, that it, we ratchet it down in order to remove the temptation to achieve national prestige for other nations by emulating the nuclear capability. So I don't think it's a fantasy. I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. And I think that that's compatible with the idea that you that um, human nature will continue to have dangerous elements. This e emailer read the blank slate and, and says, I'm interested in your opinion on the current status of academia. Is it safe, i.e. politically correct, to abandon the blank slate for genetics in areas such as political science, sociology, history, and education, or do we have to wait for a new generation of teachers to figure this out? Um, I think it, it, there still is uh, a, a great stigma against a uh, biologically oriented conception of human nature in, in many of the humanities, in a lot of uh, literary criticism, in a lot of um, uh, political science, in education. Uh, so the state of academia that the uh, email I was writing about is certainly, mm -hmm. uh, uh, certainly true. I, mean, I don't think we have to wait another generation from now, because I see it starting to change, especially in a younger generation that hasn't grown up with the same um, uh, good versus evil ideology that uh, was true in the 1970s. And I see tremendous interest in all of these fields in uh, renewed attention to human nature. Did you ever face any kind of, uh, of problems in your work? Uh, I never faced anything like kind of illiberal or nasty. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I got you know vicious reviews and so on, but that's you, know, you write a book, you have to expect those. But in terms of what greeted, say, E. O. Wilson, a generation mm -hmm. before me, um, having a bucket of ice water dumped on his head at a conference, um, some people get uh, have gotten death threats, uh, protesters, 
chanting mobs, disrupting lectures. I've never gotten anything like that, which I think is a sign that the, the, the climate, is, climate is changing. You were at MIT for how long? Uh, 21 years. And how long have you been at Harvard now? Uh, this is my sixth year, so a little more than five. I, I guess I should go back. You came from Harvard. Yes, I, have my, <laughs> I, I taught in, uh, at Harvard for a year and then Stanford for a year before settling at MIT for 21 years and then going back to Harvard five years ago. And what's your philosophy of teaching? Oh, uh, it very much overlaps with my philosophy of, uh, of writing. And many of the examples that I use and many of the organizational outlines and plans that I use go back and forth between my teaching and my writing. It's a similar audience. It's smart, intellectually curious people, but who people who just don't know the, the jargon and the methods of a particular field, but are voluntarily interested in learning. Uh, I feel that material has to be organized in a framework. It can't just be a random uh, dumping of facts in the, on the lap of an audience. So you have to do that, in, I think, in writing. You have to do that in teaching. It's got to be engaging. But, uh, but I, I do ask of the audiences of my book and of my students that they do have to think hard. Uh, I have to, my part of the bargain is I don't hide from them information that they need to figure something out. Their part of the bargain is to think through the, 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 the tough ideas. And of course, there are also differences. I have, you know, <laughs> there are exams for my students, not for my readers. Uh, I have a textbook in addition to my popular book for my students that shows the original data, the graphs, the, stud the details of the studies. So they're not just getting a digest of the conclusions, but they actually see how the original studies were done. If so I there are differences. If I walked into your classroom, would I see a, an active debate? Um, you would see in the in the lectures not a lot of uh, it, well it depends in my big lecture classes not in the lecture hall so much but in the discussion sections so I always have discussion sections of of uh, fifteen students where there is debate in my uh, seminars more like a dozen people instead of three hundred people then lots yeah Oklahoma City go ahead uh, yes uh, Dr Panger. Um, has your work been uh, influenced in any way by uh, Wittgenstein's work um, or his concepts of uh, cognitive thought, and uh, if so, how? And what would Wittgenstein say of the tabula rasa concept? Uh, thank you. Okay. Uh, my, I have been influenced by uh, Wittgenstein in the, in the following specific way. Um, namely, Wittgenstein pointed out that a lot of human concepts don't have crisp definitions that characterize them perfectly. His famous example was a game. What do all games have in common? Or what's the definition of game? Well, it can't be winner or, uh, winners and losers because you've got you know, solitaire, you've got a kid throwing a ball against a wall. Uh, it can't be physical activity because you've got chess. And no matter what you try to put into the definition, you can find counterexamples. So he suggested that human concepts are family resemblance categories. That is, they the different games or the different tools, the different vegetables, each subset shares different properties the way pairs of members of a family might share a hair color or nose or eye color uh, without everyone having one thing in common or some number of things in common. So I think that was a great insight about human conceptual categories, which I've written about a number of times. On the other hand, I think Wittgenstein was... Um, in other ways, not so sympathetic, or I'm not so sympathetic to his, his uh, approach. There was something behaviorist, uh, behavioristic about Wittgenstein in the sense that he did not take seriously uh, mental representations as contents of, of the mind. He, uh, I think he would have thought it a mistake to even talk about the kind of things that I like to study, like mental images, like rules of language, like uh, mental representations of the meaning of a sentence. I think Wittgenstein would have said that those were all confusions, but I take them quite seriously as a, as a non-behaviorist. Uh, Mesa, Arizona. My question for Dr. Pinker has to do with language and the choice of language we use in everyday normal life. And I'm talking about English, French, Spanish. And how these things relate to the First Amendment and the guarantees for free speech therein. You know, when we think of free speech, we usually think of it as guaranteeing lofty principles like uh, political thought or uh, art expression. But I'm talking about ordinary, everyday language, uh, because here in the Southwest, uh, 
We have over a million uh, Spanish speakers just in the state of Arizona, and we have no official uh, U.S. language of English, so a lot of Spanish people say, hey, why can't we have everything in our language? There is no official language. You're from Quebec, from the two solitudes, so I would like your opinion on how language, choice of language, relates to the First Amendment. Well, how it relates to the First Amendment per se might better be left to a, a, a legal scholar. I don't think that the First Amendment would either protect or, uh, or outlaw the use of languages other than, than English, but I'm not a, a, a constitutional uh, scholar. Um, I, I think there has to be some kind of, um, of eclecticism. That is, I don't think the government should ever make use of language, uh, a particular language, I illegal. Maybe that falls under the First Amendment, I, I don't know. I think it should provide opportunities for everyone to master English, uh, including children in school. I think a lot of uh, so-called bilingual education programs in the United States have been uh, unsuccessful because they keep children in Spanish-only classes for far too long. Uh, I think education should take advantage of the fact that children are, are especially good at, at mastering uh, language to make sure that they're exposed to English early on. Uh, but I don't think that there should be any kind of coercion, um, especially outside school, uh, that would outlaw the use of, of language. I think whether government documents should be uh, provided in another language should be a matter of, of pragmatism and common sense. If you don't want, if it's just a fact that there are a lot of people who aren't going to understand traffic laws in English and you're testing them for a driver's license, it's probably a better idea to have people who know the laws when licensing them than to use that as your battleground for uh, complete English mastery. Um, so I, I would prefer not to be ideological about it. And, treated on a common sense basis. This emailer asked, do you find that a child learning two languages simultaneously thinks in a different way than a monolingual child? Um, probably not uh, dramatically differently. It's certainly not true, as many people used to believe, and probably some people still believe, that uh, being bilingual hurts you cognitively, that uh, there used to be these myths that children would get confused, uh, they, they'd be liable to learning disabilities, they would associate one language with masculine things and another one with feminine things if they learn one from ma and one from pa, uh, all of which have turned out to be, to, to be myths. What children do get in, in uh, mastering two languages is probably a better appreciation of language as an object itself. That is, they know that there are these things called languages. Uh, in fact, some studies that I did many years ago showed that bilingual children are better able than monolingual children to uh, think about language. That is, if you ask them, why, is a, why do we call a cup a cup? Uh, a monolingual child will say, well, because that's where you put your coffee and it's got a handle. Uh, and a bilingual child will say, well, if you called it something else, no one would know what you're talking about. And the second answer, of course, is the correct answer. Words are arbitrary labels shared in a community. And when you know that you have to call it a cup in, uh, with, with one group of people and something else with another group of people, you're forced to think about what language is and how it works. So that's a definite advantage of bilingualism. But I don't think it makes bilinguals think differently across the board. Stanford, go ahead. Uh, hi. Hi, Stephen. Uh, great afternoon. Thanks for taking my call, C-SPAN. Two quick questions. Firstly, you partly covered the first one um, in your uh, statements about violence, but Barbara Oakley has written a book which you um, uh, endorsed on a cover called Evil Genes. And my question is, do you subscribe to the concept of evil genes and therefore, of course, good genes? And the second question is, do you completely reject um, Skinner and the behaviorist approach? And do you really feel that there is nothing in the statement that behavior is in fact shaped by its consequences. Yeah. First one, well I think um, what o Oakley's book uh, specifically referred to is the phenomen phenomenon of uh, psychopathy. Uh, and these are people who seem to have no conscience from the time of their children. They're, as kids they often bully younger children, torture animals, lie habitually. Uh, some of them grow up to be, a very small number grow up to be serial killers, but some grow up to be con artists and, uh, and, and troublemakers. Uh, so the, uh, the research seems to suggest that there is some small percentage 
perhaps three to five percent of, uh, of, especially of men, who seem to be lacking this um, uh, sense, moral sense, sense of conscious con- uh, conscience. And we don't know the causes, but I think it's a good bet that at least some of the cases are genetic. We know that some forms of early brain damage, especially damage to the frontal lobes, can lead to a symptom, uh, a syndrome that's a kind of acquired psychopathy. So not all the cases are genetic, but it looks like uh, some proportion of them are. Um, and the second question was on B.F. Skinner. Right. Yes, um, yeah. B.F. Skinner was... Uh, he was around at Harvard when I uh, arrived as a graduate student. He was probably the most famous, world's most famous psychologist in the 1960s and early 1970s. He uh, was an advocate of the school of thought called behaviorism, according to which a science of behavior should not um, worry about mental entities. So forget rules, memories, emotions, thoughts, plans, goals desires, all of that was uh, pseudoscientific mumbo-jumbo, like, like fairies and, and elves, that science should concentrate entirely on laws of behavior. How the frequency of behavior is influenced by the immediate stimulus situation and the past. It was the dominant school in psychology, but uh, it was overturned in the 1960s by the cognitive revolution, which showed that you could study things like emotions, memories, plans, goals, and so on. Uh, and I reject behaviorism as a uh, restrictive philosophy that says you can't study these things or that it's unscientific to do so. Nonetheless, it is certainly true that behavior is uh, responsive to consequences, what Skinner called the uh, following Thorndike, the law of effect. So it's not that that is false, just that you can't really understand how behavior is sensitive to consequences unless you know something about uh, what the person knows and what the person wants. Um, so I, I don't think that looking at the sensitivity of behavior to the environment is incompatible with a mentalistic viewpoint. In fact, I think you need the mentalistic viewpoint to predict what people will do with their circumstances. Sebastopol, uh, California. California. Go ahead. Tell us if I press Hello. Go ahead. Uh, yes, years ago I read uh, Benjamin Worf's book, Language, Thought, and Reality. And in it, uh, he proposes the idea that a language both constrains or can constrain and guide conceptual thinking. Uh, I'd like your comments on that, and I'll hang up. Thank you. Yes, this is a famous... Uh, linguistic determinism hypothesis, also called the Worfian hypothesis after Benjamin Lee Worf. And I have a chapter on that in The Stuff of Thought. Uh, I think Worf went way overboard that in saying that um, we think in structures made available by our native language, uh, that some things are literally inconceivable if they can't be expressed by our language, um, I think that's a, a, a gross exaggeration. I think thought is prior to language. If it weren't, children would never be able to learn a language in the first place. We would never be able to change the language, and languages change all the time. We would never be able to translate from one language to another. This isn't to say that language can't influence thought, and and I discuss ways in in the book in which language does influence thought, certainly in the course of conversation. That's why we have language. And also, we use snatches of language as computational tools, such as when we do arithmetic and we retrieve formulas in a language that we've memorized, like 8 times 7 is 56, a little sort of tape loop that we have stored in our mind, framed in language that's very useful in doing uh, arithmetic. But uh, uh, I think there are many forms of language, that, of thought, that are not in language. I think there, is, there are mental images of sounds and sights and bodily sensations. I think there's an abstract sense of meaning or gist or concepts that corresponds to what a sentence means, to what makes two sentences synonymous, to what makes one sentence a translation uh, of another in a different language, without which language would be impossible. So I think Worf went way too far. Do you have a favorite book? A of single yours. favorite book. Oh, of mine. Of yours. Oh, of mine. No, no, no. Okay. Of yours. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that, uh, I mean, it's always tempting to say the most recent one is my right. favorite, but I have to say How the Mind Works. Mm-hmm. Just Why? because it was so, well, it was so uh, audacious. Uh, I still can't, can barely believe that I wrote a book with that title. But it was my attempt to sum up the subject matter of, of, uh, of my life's work. 
uh, and uh, to actually put between two covers a uh, general theory of how, how the mind works. Who's published most of your books? My, uh, uh, most recently, Penguin, mm -hmm. uh, in the United States. All of my books but one, all my, my trade books but one have been published by Penguin in, in uh, Britain. In the U.S., uh, also Norton published How the Mind Works, and uh, HarperCollins publishes um, both Words and Rules and The Language Instinct. But and for the time being, I'm a Penguin author. We mentioned uh, the uh, Language Instinct being one of the bestsellers. What was, uh, which other book of your books have been well, New York the, Times bestsellers or bestsellers? The uh, Blank Slate uh, mm -hmm. was on the Times bestseller list for, mm -hmm. for five weeks, mm -hmm. and the, uh, the Stuff of Thought has been on the, the Times bestseller list. So, not just your, your most recent books. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Well, we're going to take another break and then come back and we will have some more phone calls and about uh, 55 more minutes with our guest. I've long believed in uh, that uh, bookshelves should be arranged in cubes. I think bookends are a nuisance. The books always flop around. Uh, and also, cubes allow you to organize books by, by uh, subject which is essential if you have as many books uh, as I do. So I got uh, a labeler, and at some point a few years ago, I discovered a place on the web that sells modular cubicle bookshelves. You can add to them up, down, sideways as your needs changed. In fact, I brought these with me from a much smaller apartment when I moved here. I'm also uh, not only read and write a lot of books, but I'm married to someone who does, and when we uh, got together, we merged our collections, which even added to the confusion because we're interested in many of the same topics, like philosophy, like history. Uh, so it was absolutely essential to get organized. Uh, the um, so we have these are more. Uh, we, we merged our books, but these are uh, have a greater concentration from Rebecca than me. But we've got uh, history of philosophy, philosophy of mind. Uh, then we've got particular philosophers. Here we've got uh, Spinoza. Rebecca wrote a book on Spinoza. Rousseau. Kurt Gödel. She wrote a book on Gödel. Uh, we've got existentialism over here. History of science. And my books tend to be a little uh, higher. We've got we've got general science. There's uh, medicine. Uh, Richard Dawkins has his own cube. Uh, we have books on engineering. Biography and memoir. There's a whole string of cubes. So while we're over here, could you pull a book or two off the shelf and just tell us, you know, ones that really you find very important or interesting that you like a lot? Well, let's see. In fact, kind of timely. Richard Dawkins, the selfish gene, is uh, I think one of the best uh, trade science books ever written. Um, because not only is it uh, clear and witty and stylish, but it actually had an impact uh, in science itself. Uh, he was making a contribution both to the public understanding of science, but also offered a framework for biologists themselves to rethink what they were doing. And I suspect that this book gets more citations in the primary scientific literature than the vast majority of uh, technical scientific papers. A book that I bought when I was an undergraduate in 1975, Noam Chomsky, Reflections on Language, that I have uh, used ever since. It's actually quite yellow. I think this is not this is before the era of acid-free paper, and uh, so it's might sort of self-compost one of these days. Oh, The Mountain of Names. This was a wonderful book by a journalist, Alex Shumatov, on um, how names uh, spread, uh, how they're given, uh, and actually using names as uh, really more of an excuse to study the uh, phenomenon of genealogy and kinship. So if you go back a few generations, one person's family tree inevitably overlaps with someone else's, and therefore any two people will be uh, related. It's a phenomenon sometimes called pedigree collapse, that any person's pedigree extends outward 
as you go back in time until it, uh, there weren't enough people to go around, in which case it collapses back upon itself. The phenomenon I first learned about from this book, somehow it stuck in memory for several decades, and when I had to write that article, uh, I went back to it and found exactly the annotations that I had made uh, uh, several decades before. These are organized by subject. This is the nonfiction side. And uh, Rebecca is a novelist, and so whenever anyone does something, they're always an expert in what they do. Like, I know musicians have huge record collections, and novelists have huge collections of novels. In the case of the novels, there are so many that just to have a fiction section would have been useless. So these are, these are alphabetical. That seems very anal retentive, but it was a, uh, it was a necessity. So here I have uh, reference books. I've got the compact Oxford English Dictionary. Uh, I have a bunch of uh, grammars and style manuals, books of wordplay, uh, puns, anagrams, palindromes. Uh, now with the web, I rely on these less than I used to. Uh, dictionaries, uh, the Oxford Companion to English Literature, I have to look up a, uh, a literary reference. Uh, books of quotations, uh, Bartlett's, uh, Isaac Asimov's Book of Science quotations. Uh, oh, They Never Said It, a wonderful book of... Uh, fake quotes, misquotes, and misleading attributions to get me out of the writer's habit of attributing everything to Mark Twain. <laughs> I've got the 776 uh, even stupider things ever said. Uh, dictionary of popular Yiddish words, phrases, and proverbs. Oh, and invaluable uh, is the uh, Christopher Surf and Victor Navasky's The Experts Speak, where for any subject you can go back and find some expert making a spectacularly embarrassing wrong prediction about how it would turn out. <laughs> I'm working on a book on the uh, decline of violence, and so this is just a sample of the books that I uh, <coughs> promised myself to read, uh, including uh, The Chemical Weapons Taboo on Killing, Preventing Genocide, Evolutionary Psychology and Violence, uh, Structures of Social Life, The State War and the State of War, Eichmann uh, in Jerusalem, uh, the original, which I got from my mother. She'd had it since, this is an original hardcover from 1963 when the book came out, and she just gave it to me. Uh, this was <coughs> the, the book that established that uh, quite ordinary people can do uh, atrocious things just in the course of their everyday work. I, I keep here copies of uh, all of my own books in all of the different editions and translations. Every time I get a translation or a book comes out in a new uh, edition, I'll uh, add it to this collection. Could you share with us some of these languages? That uh... Yes, so this is, uh, it's going to be really embarrassing if I get this wrong. Uh, well, here's the language instinct in Arabic. Uh, L'Istinto del Linguaggio, so there is an Italian. But if I'm not mistaken, I think this is Hungarian. Uh, Hungarian is not an Indo-European language, and so it's completely unrecognizable uh, from the, uh, unlike the Italian, L'Istinto del Linguaggio, which, by the way, tells us that both instinct and language are, were, are from Latin. And there's L'Instinct du Langage, French. Uh, der Sprachinstinkt in uh, German. Then I've got how the mind works in various languages. I think this is Korean, if I'm not mistaken. This is Japanese. Como funciona la mente uh, from, in uh, Spanish. Como funciona, uh, and, uh, como funciona l'esprit in French. Apparently in German, there's no, there was no way to translate it because uh, there's no word for uh, the mind that's exactly equivalent to ours. So they have the very strange title, Wie das Denken im Kopf entsteht, how, kind of how thoughts come out of the head. <laughs> that's the best they could do. Here's uh, Polish, how the mind works. And in fact, I visited Poland uh, to publicize a subsequent book. Here, the, uh, my publisher, Penguin Books, 
There's a lovely tradition that if you, when, their, when one of their authors gets a book on the New York Times bestseller list, they make up a fancy copy of it with a leather binding, gold trim, gold pages, and they give it a monogram and they give it to the uh, author as a, uh, as a keepsake and, and a reward. So I have that together with the version that's actually sold in stores. Then the British publisher always has a, their own cover. So this is the uh, American cover with uh, these colored icons representing the stuff of thought. And, and the Brits had a completely different idea of what sells. <laughs> they also uh, decided that it didn't need its subtitle. So the American edition uh, the subtitle, which I think is pretty descriptive, is Language is a Window into Human Nature. Um, but the uh, British edition has no subtitle. I think the British also had a little marketing, had a little marketing gimmick where they took one of the chapters of the Stuff of Thought and they uh, reprinted it as a uh, little micro book that they sold for a, a few pence. This is one of the seven words you can't say on television, an homage to George Carlin is from the chapter on swearing from the book, and they uh, sold it separately. They did that also with, uh, from my previous book, they excerpted a chapter called Hotheads and sold it separately. They managed to spell my name wrong on the, uh, <laughs> on the spine, but, <laughs> but I've, uh, I've forgiven them. And then uh, uh, Rebecca's, well, since I'm married to another author, we, we have a collection of her fiction and nonfiction uh, also here, and in, again in various languages, editions, bindings, and so on. How many books do you think you own? All in all. Jesus, it's like one of these those exercises uh, that they give math students, like you know how many hot dogs are sold at Fenway Park on any given night. I think I probably have to uh, imagine how many bookshelves and multiply by the linear feet. I, I, I don't know. It must be in the, in the thousands. our guest Stephen Pinker, who's our guest this month on In-Depth, more about uh, 40 minutes of your phone calls and questions via email. You'll see the phone numbers at the bottom of your screen and the email address if you'd like to join us. How's a word born? Oh, <laughs> well, it has to start with someone. Mm -hmm. Some wordsmith somewhere has to have the light bulb that allows him or her to put a sound together with a concept that doesn't yet have a label. And it's a bit mysterious how it happens. Most of us are bad at conjuring nonsense syllables out of the air, like you know, blick or, 
<coughs> or glorg. Um, so first, a sound has to come to mind. Often this will be encouraged by sound symbolism. There are certain sounds that feel like they go with certain concepts. Um, bling, um, grungy, scuzzy, uh, gonzo. Uh, they probably had the odds in their favor for being connected to what we now use them for. Usually there has to be some kind of lexical gap. That is a concept that's worth talking about that for which the language doesn't yet supply a word. And then there's this mysterious process of epidemiology, of, of co- word contagion. You use it someone else has to remember it and use it with someone else who has to remember it and use it with someone else until it becomes epidemic and then it becomes a new word in the language. So all three of those processes are somewhat mysterious and it's almost impossible to predict what words will catch on and uh, what concepts will remain nameless. So I'm presuming that the proliferation of the visual medium has made the, the number of words that can catch on and be used by people even yes, faster, uh, much faster. Uh, than print you. must uh, must greatly expand the number of words that can be kept in circulation at any one time, because you don't have to rely on on your memory or your small neighborhood of contacts. You know, I saw a word the other day that I thought was perfect in thinking about this program that described and sounded like uh, what it is, and that's the word slugabed. Oh, and yeah. it actually uh, is a person who sleeps late in the morning. Oh, it's a, yeah, it's a terrific word. Slug a bed yeah. makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Let's go to Wichita, Kansas first. Go ahead. Yes, hi, uh, Dr. Baker. Thank you for taking my call. My question was uh, regarding metaphorical concepts that you use. And you mentioned, for example, um, an old paradigm we had about uh, the mind being a blank slate or a fairly contemporary one, such as the mind being uh, a, a processing machine. Um What is the particular challenge of finding the right metaphorical concepts in your field, and uh, do you have one that you're somewhat privy to right now that you prefer as, as, for example, you mentioned the uh, language as a window into human nature? Um, That's my question. Thank you. Yes. (coughs) There is a discussion in the book on why metaphors are so common in science the realm of discourse in which we feel we have the surest route to, uh, to truth. Uh, and there's a big difference between the use of metaphor in poetry and everyday conversation on the one hand and science on the other, which is in science you always have to be mindful uh, of which aspects of the metaphor or analogy you take seriously and which are just ornamentation or flesh on the skeleton that just, to use two more metaphors, that get in the way of understanding. And often, when a metaphor is introduced in science, there will be some misunderstandings and some debate and subsequent clarification as to what aspects of the metaphor ought to be taken seriously. I'll give two examples. The Selfish Gene, the uh, book that I alluded to in the intermission. Uh, No one should believe or can believe that DNA actually has motives or consciousness or intentions in the same way that a human brain has uh, intentions and consciousness. Nonetheless, the metaphor is useful in the sense that the genes will be selected for effects that replicate copies of that gene. So that's a kernel of meaning shared by selfishness as we apply it to people and selfishness as Richard Dawkins applied it to genes. And as long as you focus on that common core of meaning and don't get distracted by things like conscious intentions, it can continue to be useful. Uh, Another one is the brain as a computer, which was popular in the 1960s in my own field in cognitive psychology. Well, again, there can be a lot of misleading uh, aspects to that if you took it too seriously. The idea that the brain uh, follows uh, discrete rules, the way a computer follows steps in a program. The idea that the brain does things one at a time in serial order as opposed to massively parallel fashion. Those could certainly be misleading. On the other hand, there probably is, in fact, I would argue that in fact there is a common thread that applies both to the explanation of what makes brains intelligent and the explanation of what compu- makes computers intelligent, and that would be some kind of information processing. So. In, uh, in my current concerns, one um, 
auxiliary metaphor that I used in the, the stuff of thought was that language is not just a window into human nature, but a, a fistula, that is, a, a gaping hole in, in, uh, in a tissue. Uh, and that's because w one of the reasons that we're often so circumspect about using language, we don't just blurt out what we mean, but we often veil our, in our intentions in innuendo and euphemism and doublespeak, is because using language directly can reveal too much about ourselves, and we often have to take self-protective measures uh, to prevent infection, as one is vulnerable to if one has a, a fistula, an, an open wound. And so language isn't, just doesn't, has not just the positive connotations of revealing the workings of the mind, but the possible dangerous connotations of allowing us to be infected by information that we get. Well, here's an emailer who wants to talk about the whole issue of not saying necessarily what we mean because of politeness. And they said that uh, the response to thank you in, uh, today has changed from your welcome to no problem. No problem, yes. Yeah. Uh, the person no. says, I much prefer the first because it seems to be a more gracious response than the second, which seems dismissive. Will you talk a little bit about the various automatic politenesses that we have? Yes, there's a, a whole range of expressions that we use without thinking too much about what they literally mean, such as, you're welcome. I don't even know if, even prior to this conversation, I ever thought about what it means to say you're welcome. I, I guess it means there's no, no imposition, feel free to ask for something similar again in the future. Uh, no problem, of course, means it is, I am not... Uh, putting myself, or I don't mind the fact that I have been putting myself out to accede to your request mm -hmm. because I like you so much that uh, what ordinarily would be a problem is not one in this case if I can help you. And now, we don't really think through the, the literal content. They become formulas that you have to learn when you learn a native language. One of the first things that you learn when you go to some other country, even if you know nothing else about Italian, you learn how to say, please, thank you, excuse me. Yeah, excuse me is a little odd, too, when you think about it. <laughs> Especially when you go up to a stranger and you say, excuse me, do you know the time? Um, you're asking for forgiveness <laughs> before you even... Right. As if the mere asking of the question is some kind of injury for which you, you need um, uh, forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't think about these, but we absolutely depend on them in order to be conversational speakers. And th that's one category of politeness. The other category that I'm more interested in, in my own research, is when we compose the request for the occasion. Uh, sometimes our, uh, it's called off-record uh, indirect speech as opposed to on-record. On-record indirect speech is, please, thank you, you're welcome, can you pass the salt, do you know the time? Each of which, when you think about it, uh, is a little odd in terms of its literal content, but it's a, a move in a, in a game that we all know what to make. An off-record indirect speech act would be something like, um, uh, gee, I have a really nice view from my balcony. Would you like to come up for coffee at the end of a date? Uh, which can be interpreted as a sexual uh, come on. There it's not a formula that you memorize, but both the speaker and the hearer have to do a little minuet figuring out what's really going on. Uh, and those are two different kinds of politeness. There's a third kind uh, where you use false terms of uh, affiliation or even kinship. Hey, brother, or buddy, or uh, use of in-group slang, you lend me a couple of bucks, where you uh, impose a kind of spurious friendship or camaraderie in approaching someone. Uh, those are just three of the many kinds of politeness that linguists have uh, tried to analyze. Santa Fe, New Mexico, hello. Hi, Dr. Singer. Um, first of all, I just wanted to say how much I really enjoyed your book, The Stuff of Thought. Oh, thank you. And in particular, a question came to mind in the chapter of what's in a name? Uh, this is a concept, the power of a name is a concept that's been around, especially in sci-fi fantasy for a long time with Ursula Le Guin and stuff. And you talked about it as um, particularly proper names as the way we refer to an individual in every conceivable circumstance. So I was curious as to what your thoughts are on how names have played a role in our current political situation. You mean, for example, Barack Hussein Obama? Exactly. Yes. And the more um, acceptable, conservative, uh, Christian-based name of John. Oh, I see. yes. Uh, well, it's, these are examples of how people don't intuitively 
uh, conform to the linguist's idea that a name is an arbitrary label. That's one of the first things you learn in linguistics, that a sound can be anything as long as it's consistently used to refer to uh, its referent. But people, uh, people don't buy it uh, intuitively. Swearing is an example where we think that the moral order is threatened by merely uttering a word, even though uh, using a polite synonym refers to the same thing, but we feel that there's some huge moral difference between them. Uh, prayer is another example of what's sometimes called word magic. That is, thinking that words are actually lawfully connected to the thing they stand for. It's almost as if it's one of your essential traits, as opposed to a label that, that, that your mom just gave you, uh, when you when you were born. In the, in the case of uh, Barack Obama, uh, the, the fact that his middle name is Hussein, widespread throughout not just the Arab world, but in Africa, where his uh, father uh, came from, and I believe it was the name of his paternal grandfather, people, no matter how many times they're told, can't shake off this intuition that uh, Obama is a Muslim, because he has a name that's traditionally associated with, with many Muslims. And I think even people who would not credit it if they thought it through allow themselves to be infected by that feeling, well, maybe deep down he is sympathetic to the Arab world, despite his repeated, heartfelt, sincere declarations of, of uh, solidarity with Israel, he might favor the, the Arabs because of that middle name. Now, it makes no sense. A name is just, you know, what's in a name, as Shakespeare said, but I think it's part of that psychological phenomenon of, of word magic, that we think that the person's essence is revealed through his name. Louisville. Hi. Um, I work with brain injury patients, and I actually we recently have two new patients who both have severe aphasias. Um, one of them has a global aphasia, and the other one it's more like he can find the category of the word he wants, but not the actual word. <laughs> and I was wondering if you had any tips or hints or anything for working with patients who are aphasic. Oh, um, again, this is one of those questions that I'm kind of, in a sense, it's above my pay grade in that I was not, never received clinical training or have clinical expertise. Uh, certainly, it very much depends on uh, the age of the person and on the idiosyncrasies of their particular uh, brain injury, how much and what kind of therapy can be effective. In some cases, it can be extremely uh, effective. Uh, and uh, probably you and the clinical neurologists and neuropsychologists that you work with are aware of programs of therapy and rehabilitation that can make the most of what language skills these patients still have. You wrote um, in a Newsweek story some time ago, depressed people don't have lazy souls. <laughs> the parts of their brains that could snap out of it are not uh, working properly. To depressed people, it is objectively obvious that their prospects are hopeless. Uh, tweaking the brain with drugs may sometimes be the best way to jumpstart the machinery that we call the will. Yes. Uh, I don't... Uh, syndromes like, uh, like depression mm -hmm. probably are, uh, can, are heterogeneous across people. I think in, in all cases there's a common core that depression is a, an adaptive response to uh, certain kinds of loss, situations that force you to stop what you've been doing, to rethink your situation, perhaps to see the world more accurately. Most of us are the, uh, the victims or the beneficiaries of positive illusions. We actually overestimate how competent we are, how knowledgeable, how effective, what our chances in life are. It probably helps us to, to keep going. And in many ways, depressed people have a more accurate assessment of, the, uh, of life's odds than non-depressed people. And I think that's the reason why we're subject to depression uh, in the first place. There are cases in which we have to slow down, uh, stop doing what we've been doing. You know, as you say, they say about holes, the first law of the hole is if you're in one, stop digging. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, there are also cases in which depression can take on a life of its own. When it's uh, too, when it's longer lasting than any possible adaptive readjustment of your life. Because of heritable differences, some people are just innately more susceptible to depression than others. Uh, because of uh, abnorm abnormalities in brain chemistry that can prolong a depression uh, beyond any point of usefulness. 
And for those things, I'm not at all squeamish about uh, the, the proper use of antidepressants. Uh, and the attitude that you sometimes hear, well, depressed people, they just need a swift kick in the, in the rear end. They're just being lazy. Um, is, can, can be deeply uh, ignorant and, and cruel because to the person who's in the depressed state, it's just objectively correct that, that life is hopeless. And uh, it's not a matter of just getting a, a swift kick, but really jump-starting yourself into the point of view where something that you do can make a difference, which is exactly what you aren't thinking in the uh, throes of a deep depression. So I think an understanding just that the brain is a, a, a biochemical system and intelligently applied changes to that chemistry I think can be enormously humane. And what about the situation in terms of the relative, uh, its relativity to language? Have there been any studies done to mental illness versus the use of language or the extent of vocabulary of people who have uh, uh, experience depression or mental illness? Yeah, there is. There is, does seem to be a difference in, in depression and anxiety. That mm -hmm. uh, anxiety seems to involve uh, images. You imagine yourself in some threatening situation and um, vividly uh, and concretely live through what it would be like to be in this threatening or challenging scenario. Depression seems to be a bit more verbal. You, uh, people who are depressed will say things to themselves like, life is hopeless, there's no reason to go on, nothing makes any difference, uh, there's no, life isn't wor has nothing that makes it worth living. Uh, and I don't know why there is this difference, but depression seems to be a bit more verbal, anxiety a little bit more imagistic. Let's go to San Diego next. Hello. Hi. This is Denise. Hi, Dr. Baker. Hello. Um, I was just curious on your thoughts with, first of all, a couple questions are kind of connected. Carl Jung and his collective unconscious and how that would work with the brain chemistry. And then since our senses are um, what are subjective to what we see, hear, think, feel, um, how can you explain to me what, Things like telepathy or the collective unconscious or chemistry between others or experiences outside of knowledge, outside of your thinking mind. Can, is there a way for you to explain through your studies those experiences or do you even believe in them? Yeah. And that's it. Well, Jung, in talking about universal archetypes, themes and symbols that people in many cultures seem to find compelling, I think was talking about certain features of human nature. There are certain themes that people everywhere will find fascinating, such as a righteous hero conquering evil, uh, perhaps winning the love of a worthy woman, uh, fights against animals, conflicts within a family. And uh, collective unconscious may be a fancy way of talking about themes of, uh, that we all uh, appreciate because of our shared nature. Jung's particular mechanism of uh, collective racial memory, that somehow something happens to a tribe and it gets internalized, is very unlikely. And in answer to the question of uh, telepathy, out-of-body experiences, and so on, I believe the, the evidence suggests that, they're, that they don't exist. So that makes it easy to look for an explanation, namely there's nothing to explain, and so you don't need anything fancy. I think all of the uh, attempts to get around coincidence, false memory, uh, outright charlatans, such as stage magicians who use magic tricks to make you think that they're doing telepathy, all of those have been exposed, and uh, there's no reason right now to believe that there's anything that can't be accounted for by the laws of physics and brain physiology. Texas next, Wimberley, Texas. Hello? You're on the air. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, given the work that you do in cognitive science and linguistics, I was wondering if you've reached any conclusions over the old uh, metaphysical debate uh, in philosophy called the problem of universals. In other words, the, uh, the realism, nominalism debate over concepts. Well, uh, I think the answer might be different for different kinds of concepts. And some of this... Um, pertains to debates in philosophy where I can't 
claim any expertise. Let's say numbers. Uh, I think there are many mathematicians who would say that they have a, a kind of reality. It's not that they're out there in some part of the universe, but that they exist independent of uh, human knowers, so that, such that all intelligent agents would have to discover their properties in, in much the same ways. That's a position in the philosophy of mathematics that I, I find uh, congenial. Uh, for things like um, you know, Democrats and Republicans, or uh, a rook in chess, or a goalie in hockey, uh, whether they have some reality independent of human knowers is much more obscure, and I don't know if I have a, a strong opinion on that. Certainly when you enter into some kind of games uh, rule system, certain things necessarily follow, so there's a sense in which they have uh, reality to, when they're well specified. But um, more than that would be probably more metaphysical than I can credibly uh, pronounce on. Next uh, question for Dr. Pinker is from San Francisco. Hey, greetings. I, you know, I wanted to ask you about the old parable about Babylon and uh, whether you have any, any concept about that. I, I don't know if you've got any economic training in um, if you have a... a uh, concept of that, and uh, before that, uh, you were at, you had a question came up just a minute ago about uh, Barack Obama's middle name and whatnot. And I'm wondering also if you're familiar with the old concept <coughs> in in Judeo-Christian uh, uh, etymology. Uh, God's true name is Yahweh, and there was a, a tradition that if you wanted to talk about God, but you didn't want God to be listening. Uh, you never said God's name, God's true name. You would say God's name slightly differently, so that uh, you could talk about him without, you know, in a kind of a theoretical sense. And I'm wondering if you, um, of course, the Muslims, Christians, and Jews are always talking about the same Yahweh, but they slightly change it to Jah or Jehovah or Allah or uh, you know, any Lord or any number of other variants. So I'm wondering if you you have any comments on either of them. Yes. Uh, uh, your first question was about the Tower of Babel. Did I hear that correctly? I think he was talking. He said Babylon. I thought he said Babylon too, but I'm wondering. But I'm, I'm wondering. Is it the Tower of Babylon? Because that would be the that it falls because of Babel, right? Yeah. Well, the Tower of Babel is a wonderful metaphor for the dispersion of, of languages and why we have so many languages now. Of course, I don't believe the, the story of the Tower of Babel. I think that that's clearly fiction. But it nonetheless is true that many language families, say all the Indo-European languages, from uh, Sanskrit and Hindi through um, uh, Farsi, it's spoken in Iran, through uh, the Romance languages, the Slavic languages, the Germanic languages, including English, all have similarities that suggest that they historically descended from a single group of speakers, some, uh, mysterious people sometimes called the Proto-Indo-Europeans. So the grain of truth in the Tower of Babel story is that you can give diverse languages as uh, descendants by a process quite similar to biological evolution from an ancestral population. But I don't believe that there's any deliberate design in it that God tried to confuse people so that they wouldn't approach heaven or all of that stuff. In terms of the names of God, I think that's a, a beautiful example of word magic. Uh, and, and you're right to connect it to the phenomenon that people have this gut feeling that Obama must be Muslim because of his name, uh, Hussein. We read far too much into names. We think they have a, a power that the actual thing that the name stands for has. Now, when it comes to uh, God, the most powerful thing that we could conceive of, then the phenomenon of word magic comes in in spades, and therefore the name of God is a very, very touchy matter. In Judaism, as you point out, uh, you, one never pronounces the name of God. In fact, no one knows how to pronounce it. Yahweh is a reconstruction of the most likely pronunciation, but by tradition it could only be uttered by the high priests in the uh, presence of the Ark of the Covenant, Covenant on the holiest day of the year. It's spelled uh, the four letters, the tetragrammaton, yud hey vav hey, which can then be uh, pronounced Jehovah, an incorrect pronunciation, but it's consistent with the letters. And you just, you, you don't go there if you're a, uh, an observant Jew. You, in fact, you don't even, nor do you use the word uh, el, or uh, casually, which is cognate with Allah, for God himself. Um, you mentioned the Lord as a euphemism. There's also uh, Hashem in Hebrew, the name. 
as a way of referring to God. Because the intuition is, and it's a, very, it's a primitive intuition, but one that people can't get away from, that as soon as you mention the name, it's as if you're, his eyes are, are on you. He's saying, yes, you called me. And you don't necessarily want your God looking at you too carefully uh, every time you, you mention the name. And so by discussing it obliquely, uh, you hope to get a little bit of, uh, of a breathing space. And I think it's a, a very similar phenomenon, and this is almost blasphemous to say it, to why we use euphemisms like the N-word, the S-word, the F-word, um, like uh, a long illness instead of cancer, or passed away instead of uh, died, that there's some emotional stab that we get when using the word for a, 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 a fraught concept that we avoid by reaching for a euphemism instead. Troy, uh, New York, hello. Hi, um, thank you for taking my call. I just wanted to know, what role does um, melanin play in the brain and also in cognitive thinking? Um, I think that most of the claims that you probably heard for the role of me melanin are exaggerated. They've gone into quite exotic and, and um, kooky theories of differences between the uh, behavior and emotions of uh, blacks versus whites. Uh, I think melanin can be involve some of the same biochemical pathways as chemicals that are involved in the uh, in the brain, but that um, I'm not sure what you're referring to. But chances are, it's some uh, pseudoscience. Is there the possibility someday of a drug that can make us more intelligent, or a drug that can make our language abilities broader? Um, I, there's nothing on the horizon that would be so specific as to improve language abilities. It's not out of the question that there could be drugs that focus attention better than our current drugs, like uh, the coffee in this cup, uh, and without the jittery side effects. Mm -hmm. It's not inconceivable that will be, there will be drugs that will enhance uh, memory. But I don't think that any of the science fiction scenarios of uh, drugs that would give you superhuman powers are uh, things that we'll see in our lifetime. The brain is just too complicated. What do you think is the most exciting research on the brain being done today? Oh, well, I think um, some of the, the studies on uh, development of the brain in, in utero and the pathways by which... Uh, uh, neurons are guided to their destinations, hook up with other um, neurons is, is exciting. I think the application of functional neuroimaging like fMRI to aspects of brain function that were pr previously just too uh, hard to look at in terms of the brain like empathy, social cognition, morality, religion is exciting. I think the study of uh, using new genomic techniques of the genetic basis of thought and emotion and personality are uh, of interest. And I think the connections to uh, evolution, using evolutionary theory to ask the, the why question, the what for question about features of human psychology is tremendously exciting. Do you think that there might be a day in which the issues of depression and uh, mental illness will be able to be um, thrown away with the with uh, actual manipulation of the brain, such as bit it's being discussed or has been tried in some people? Um, I, uh, I think they'll get better. I, I don't think they'll, they'll be cures in the same sense that we have you know, a vaccine that's done away with smallpox mm -hmm. or, or polio. I think that they're too heterogeneous, and too complicated, but I do think they'll get better. Next is Fresno, California. Hello. Oh, hi. Well? Uh, yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, please. Uh, yes, I have two questions, one to be answered briefly and one to, to in greater length. The first is um, how emotions are defined very differently from language to language. For example, pundits are, fun, are very fond of using the term schadenfreude, but they don't understand that it means maliciously it's someone else's misfortune. And the second is, uh, for instance, someone can wish when they hear someone else's good fortune that they also have the same good fortune without being envious or jealous. And I've never seen in any other language uh, reference to emotion like that, but I know many people have it. And after you answer that briefly, I have a question about the work of Damasio and other people's work in the role of emotions with reason and rationality. 
Yes, well, the, uh, we often borrow emotion words from one language to another, schadenfreude being an example, pleasure in another's misfortunes, uh, chutzpah from uh, Hebrew, uh, probably originally from uh, Slavic language, uh, angst also from uh, German, and they don't always have the same meaning as they had in the original language, chutzpah being an example, where in uh, English or uh, borrowed use of Yiddish words in English, it often refers to something good, uh, to spunk, or, or gall, or ambition, or gumption. Whereas in Hebrew, it refers to um, uh, aggressiveness, and it's, it's a bad thing. If you accuse someone of, of uh, showing chutzpah, it means they're arrogantly demanding something that they have no right to, as opposed to just being um, impressively uh, self-assertive. Uh, Schadenfreude, I'm told, has a slightly different meaning in German than uh, its use in, in uh, English. And this often happens in any kind of translation, that the word changes it, it, its meaning. Uh, I think there's so many more emotions than there are words for emotion that we're always tempted to borrow words from, uh, from other languages. Uh, emotions are continuous or analog, and words put them into discrete pigeonholes, which means there'll always be an emotional richness that we feel we have trouble expressing. And so if we learn of a word from another language that does a slightly better job than the current inventory in English, we're apt to uh, borrow it. Uh, and, um, and in doing so, like any words, there can be some loss in translation. In terms of uh, Ant Antonio Damasio has, uh, has emphasized the importance of the emotions in rationality. Uh, that, it, that there are some cases in which fear, for example, can be a, uh, an important motivator in avoiding dangerous options. He's shown that people with damage to a certain parts of the brain involving the connections between the emotional circuitry and the higher thought processes can sometimes leave a person worse off. Uh, they make foolish choices and risky decisions because they don't get that uh, wave of, of sweat or butterflies in the stomach that ordinarily inhibit us from doing stupid things. So it isn't always true that uh, emotions are a bad thing. People say sometimes that English is a lazy language in that, as you were talking about specific words, um, taking French, for example, many different actions have very specific terms to them, where in English it may get kind of jumbled into one general thought process. Is that true, or is it just because we don't use the words that yeah. are there? No, no, it isn't true. In, uh, in French, just to take one example, you have the word uh, faire, mm -hmm. which can mean either to make or to do, whereas in English we have two different words for them. Yeah. Inevitably, when you compare languages, you find areas in which one language makes a lot of distinctions and the other one lumps it together in one word, but often uh, cases where the, the reverse is true. And that in general, when any language has a uh, 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 a written form with, and has accumulated vocabulary and idioms, it will be very hard to say that one language is more expressive than another. Baltimore, hello. Hello. Uh, C-SPAN, thank you especially for In-Depth. And uh, Dr. Hofstetter, uh, <laughs> Dr. Hofstetter, I've got uh, Hofstetter on my mind. Uh, <laughs> thank you uh, for your generous time here. But listen, I would really be interested in your take on Julian Jaynes. Uh, I know that he's been dismissed by many people with his idea of the bicameral mind. And here I'm referring specifically to his book on the origin of consciousness and the breakdown of the bicameral mind. And I know that his idea of the bicameral mind has been pretty much dismissed lately. But I do find that his discussion of metaphor using the Iliad and Ulysses uh, with the idea that friends was once a uh, Greek word for the breath or even the lungs and has been adapted over time to uh, be a word for fearfulness, that is a quavering that we feel in our breathing when, we feel, when we're fearful. So it's a metaphorical uh, transfer from once what was a physiological word to now what is an emotional word. Um, I would be interested in your take on Julian Jaynes in the idea of his bicameral mind. I find some of his evidence, uh, if not compelling, at least very interesting. And uh, speaking of Hofstetter, I uh, was trying to find the book I have. It, it was a title of uh, Le Tombeau de some French uh, poet. Uh, 
Mm. And uh, he even breaks that down and that the Le Tombeau is a play on words in French that could mean the tomb or the words of. And uh, it was a very excellent book and that included a lot of the problems of the linguistic problems of translation. Thank you. Yes. Uh, it is a marvelous book by, uh, by Hofstadter uh, on the, the, the perils and complexities and richness and ambiguities of translation. I think that uh, Jean certainly went too far in implying that consciousness I itself is a recent invention of literate cultures. Uh, that that's, uh, I mean, taken literally, that's, that can't be true. I mean, your, 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 your dog or your cat is not a, a robot. It feels pain, it feels hunger. Um, babies have, uh, uh, obviously, have consciousness before they've acquired any language or have been socialized. Although he probably meant consciousness in a much narrower sense than, than the one that a neuroscientist would, would use. I think there's a danger in uh, that, that uh, genes fell into, and that was also one of my disagreements with, um, with George Lakoff, of making too much of the metaphorical roots of words. I think they are significant in, in highlighting the similarities that a person is apt to see between something abstract and something concrete. But it doesn't mean that every time someone uses a metaphor, they're actually uh, thinking through to the original image that inspired the metaphor. And so you can't, without having the flesh and blood speaker in front of you to, to, to test, to interrogate, to experiment with, just because they use a metaphor doesn't mean that they think metaphorically. And a simple way of, of showing that is, among us, to look at things like mixed metaphors, where we can't possibly be thinking through the image. Otherwise, we wouldn't say things like, uh, the ship of state is sailing up a one-way street, uh, which we, a politician uh, once said, or my favorite example that I cite in the book is the defender of Richard Nixon, who said, uh, the American press has literally emasculated Nixon, where the use of literal and the, the metaphor of emasculation, meaning remove the power and dignity from, uh, obviously didn't register it at that speaker at that moment. And so if you look back at ancient texts and you look at the metaphors they use, you don't know if it simply occurred to the coiner of the idiom as an effective way of getting that concept across at a stage in which the language didn't have any other way of expressing it, or if they really were so concrete that that image came to mind when they used the metaphor. That would be my, my principal caveat. We just have a few minutes left. We're hopefully, we have whetted people's appetites for your work. Uh, just to go through your books one more time, in case people are specifically want to pick out different parts of what we've talked about today, what will they get from the language instinct? Everything you always wanted to know about language, except what I wrote about my other two books on language. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so it's a general introduction to how language works, how it's acquired, how it changes. And how the mind works? Everything else about the mind, everything from how we see, to how we think, to our emotions, to our social uh, relationships, to humor, art, and philosophy. And words and rules? A, uh, seeing the world in a grain of sand, how to understand language through one phenomenon uh, approached through many angles. And the blank slate? The concept of human nature and why it is so politically, morally, and emotionally fraught. And finally, your most recent one, the stuff of thought. Language is a window into human nature, what our words reveal about how we think, how we feel, and how we relate to each other socially. If people are looking for more of an introduction into some of the ideas we've talked about in the last three hours, is there one of these books that you would recommend they start with? For language itself, I'd say start with the language instinct mm -hmm. for human nature, I'd say start with how the mind works. And again, when can we, um, when can we expect this next book on violence? Uh, it'll probably be published in, in uh, 011. In 11? In, in 011. How do you say that? That's in, a, a in lexical gap. <laughs> 2011. <laughs> and uh, again, its premise is? That violence has been in decline for millennia and centuries and decades, and uh, it sure would be good to know why. Stephen Pinker, thank you very much for your time and for your three hours today on In Depth. Thanks so much for having me. Sure, and thanks to our callers. Have a good day. You'll have another chance to see In Depth with author and Harvard University psychology professor Stephen Pinker next Saturday at 9 a.m. Eastern.